everybody and welcome to Giant Health. I'm here to welcome Matt Whittingham from Gallant Growth and uh, he's come all the way from Singapore, especially to be here with us and everybody in the audience. So Gallant, Gallant uh, Growth are uh, a health tech global company uh, that provide uh, deep data to all of the pharmaceuticals and insurance industry. I'll pass over to Matt to, to tell us all about it. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much. And it's uh, great to be here on the second, uh, second day of the conference and I uh, hope everybody had a very interesting first day uh, here in London. So um, thanks for the introduction. Yeah, we're going to talk today about a piece of work that Gallon Growth has um, just completed. And what we're doing is looking at pharmaceutical partnerships. And increasingly, pharmaceuticals have become very active in partnering with digital health over the last five to 10 years. But the question we sort of set ourselves, and we work with a lot of pharmaceutical clients, is are those partnerships fit for purpose? Are they genuinely impactful on strategy? Or are they more kind of for theatrics um, and, and for PR purposes? And so what we've constructed is what we're calling the Pharmaceutical Digital Health Innovation Index. And this is the first year that we've done that, which starts to look at that question. Are these really, these partnerships for fit, fit for purpose? So just a little bit about us, um, and as you heard from Tony, um, we are a Singapore-based company. We just do digital health. Uh, we have an office also in Switzerland, and we have clients typically from insurance and pharmaceutical clients from around the world. And what we do essentially is we go out worldwide and identify every single digital health venture we can and we collect and aggregate over 200 different data points. We aggregate that into our platform, which is called Health Tech Alpha. We publish all of that data. Uh, we organize that data into 16 different health tech clusters. And we assign a, a, a maturity score as well to so every single venture. And then we publish that into the venture, into the platform. And then what we do on the client side we work with insurance and pharmaceutical clients. Typically, those clients are trying to understand the digital health ecosystem and how do they find the right venture from thousands of different possibilities out there that matches an exact problem statement. So we do a lot of scouting work, a lot of consultancy, and a lot of insight work for pharmaceutical and insurance clients. So what does that data look like? So within our systems, we have now over 8,000 startups worldwide uh, integrated into the system. That's around 60 different countries. We cover five continents. Uh, and as well as the startups, we also ingest investment data. Uh, we have a database of every single investor that's making investment into digital health. We track all the partnerships which the digital health ecosystem is doing with the corporates. And there's over 22,000 of those worldwide. Uh, and those are generated from 7,500 corporates. So altogether, that's 150 million data points. So very wide and a very deep uh, data set. So before we get into pharmaceutical specifics, just a quick snapshot really of digital health ventures and what that looks like in 2021. So this is a subset of the 8,100. This is uh, just over 6,000 uh, digital health ventures that are either active or private. So what we're not including here is any that have IPO'd, for example. And by the way, those are excluded from the pharmaceutical analysis. So we're just looking at this particular subset of the total global ecosystem. Um, we continue to see very strong growth in digital health. And in fact, uh, if you're in London here, uh, it's a very vibrant conference, some great technologies and gr some really uh, fantastic digital health solutions here. Uh, so that is continuing to grow. So we're still seeing almost 10% health over the last five years. And of course, the pandemic, unfortunately, has meant that probably digital health has never been more important. And you can see some of that also in inbound investment into digital health. So looking at this slide, this slide shows global investment levels uh, worldwide or by major region. So Middle East, Europe, APAC, and North America. 
And if you look at 2021 on the far right of the screen, you can see that as uh, end of October, uh, we're looking at a really blockbuster year for 2021. In fact, uh, it could be over $40 billion worth of investment worldwide going into digital health. That could end up being twice as much as last year. So very substantial uh, inbound investment. You can see here just how huge the US market is. So uh, year to date, or uh, October, 31 billion. Uh, that's driven a lot by a couple of things. One is the US market um, and stock markets in general and investment levels in general are very buoyant uh, despite the pandemic. Uh, secondly, the US market has seen a lot of special share issues through SPACs. And that's become a very uh, established way of raising capital in 2021. So that's contributing to that number. But the other thing is a growing maturity in digital health. So as the sector and category uh, matures, we're seeing a lot more uh, confidence amongst investors and a lot more inbound investment. And just two quick examples there in the US market in 2021. So Sword Health uh, attracted uh, about $150 million worth of funding in its last Series D round. Uh, perhaps even more impressive is Hinge Health, again, US digital therapeutics uh, company looking at muscular skeletal. They just closed a Series E of over 600 million US dollars, giving them a valuation of 4 billion. So this market is still really strong and still growing very strongly. So now let's look at the pharmaceutical piece. So what we set out to do here is understand exactly what's happening with pharmaceutical partnerships. And over the last five or 10 years, pharmaceuticals have become very active investors and partners in digital health. And what we're looking to understand here is does that investment, does that partnership strategy really impact their go-to-market strategy and what they're trying to achieve on a strategic level? So is there a good strategic fit? Secondly, what is the maturity of that digital health portfolio that the pharmaceuticals are investing in? Uh, what kind of uh, digital health partnerships and how mature are they? And then combining both of those data points to look at, again, does that partnership strategy lend itself to strategic success or is it really just theatrics? So here we have an analysis of uh, pharmaceutical partnerships worldwide. And there's 1,100 partnerships done to date worldwide between Pharmaco and Digital Health, which sounds a lot, and it is a lot. However, the top 10 Pharmacos actually drive 50% of all partnerships. And in fact, only 30 Pharmacos have done more than five uh, partnerships in Digital Health. And it's that 30 plus number that's included in our analysis. So as you can see here, there is a long tail of a couple of hundred Pharmacos they're kind of dabbling in this. They may have done one or two digital health partnerships, but really uh, a long way to go in terms of that long tail. Many are still experimenting. So the methodology against this innovation index for Pharmaco is built really on two key things. Firstly, the strategic fit. So this is when you look at, or when we've done the analysis on digital health partnerships worldwide, do they match the global footprint of the multinational pharmacos? Have they done digital health partnerships in those operating markets? Have they integrated the digital health solution partnership into a core therapeutic focus area? So we're gonna look at that. That may be the single most important factor here. Uh, thirdly, how well integrated or chosen are the digital health partnerships across the pharma uh, journey in terms of healthcare professional journey, all the pharma co, all the patient journey. So from research through to manufacturing, through to sales and marketing, through to customer adherence, how well matched across that journey are the partnerships? And lastly, what in terms of the number of partnerships, is that commensurate with the size of the pharmaco? So that's strategic fit. The second major area is the portfolio strength. So this is the second big area of analytics. So here we've looked at every individual digital health company that's partnering with pharmaco. 
and we're looking at a few things here. Uh, we're looking at the management team. Uh, a lot of success for any entrepreneurial digital business is uh, kind of wrapped up in the management team. How experienced are they? Uh, what are their qualifications? Have they had successful exits previously in digital businesses, etc.? So we look at that digital uh, management team and understand their capabilities. We look at how innovative is a digital health partner uh, in this instance. So that things like, do they have, how many products do they have? How many markets are they in? Have they done, achieved regulatory approvals for any of their products? Have they engaged with clinical trials around their products? So that's driving some of the innovative scores that we assign to each venture. Thirdly, financial strength. How much have they raised? What's the valuation? What is the momentum between different funding stages and what does that look like? Uh, so that's financial strength. And that really just gives us an overall score. And I mentioned earlier, we have a platform called Health Tech Alpha. That score is assigned to all of the 8,000 ventures within that platform. So a very easy, quick way of understanding the maturity and impact of a digital health company. So now we look at uh, these two metrics, and now we're going to apply these to the pharmacos. So this first one is the strategic fit. So as I mentioned, that is impact on value chain, global distribution of those partnerships, and thirdly, the match to therapeutic focus area. So top 10. So these are the top 10 pharmaco that we've ranked by strategic fit. So some very familiar names here, and I won't read them all, but Roche, AstraZeneca and Novartis in the top three. And you know, all of these companies are doing a pretty good job of strategic fit and really being careful about making sure that their st st strategic focus areas match you know, the, the, the focus of the digital venture. One thing you'll notice though perhaps here is on the right hand side, the portfolio score. Okay, so that house company you can see here that the top three pharmaco actually don't achieve a top 10 on the portfolio score so that top three have done well in terms of the strategy piece but the ventures they've selected are perhaps not best this area if we switch now to look at portfolio strength so that is essentially the maturity an ability of the venture to make an impact. Uh, here we see a very different list of companies. So top three here, Novo Nordisk, Daiichi Sankyo, Bristol Myers Squibb uh, in the top three. But again, if you look at the street strategic fit score here, these are all not ranking so well. In fact, most of these are outside even the top 20. So what's happening here is that um, They've done a great job of aligning uh, perhaps with the strategic fit, but the actual portfolio strengths of the companies they've selected is not particularly strong. And we're going to look at some specific examples of this in a second. Um, so one of the things here is that it actually is surprisingly difficult when you look at this analysis to get both of these right, to get both strategic fit and to get the right selection of ventures that can deliver against that. Uh, strategic imperative. So then what we've done is we've mapped uh, top 25 global pharma and biotech onto this two by two, just in case you can't see some of the lines on here, uh, about two thirds of the way across here, this, um, this Y axis uh, is looking at strategic fit. And then the X axis across the bottom, two thirds of the way is the, uh, sorry, Two thirds of the way up here is the average score uh, in terms of the portfolio strengths. So then what we've done is allocated each uh, farmer into the quadrant. So you can see the spread here. And you know, at first glance, there is a good selection of companies in optimal. And we're going to look at one of those in a second. Um, so those are companies that have done really well in terms of you know, high portfolio score, but also a high strategic fit score. When you look at misaligned, uh, if you look at the x-axis, you can see that they're doing well in terms of the venture portfolio selection. The ventures that they partnered with are really strong, 
However, they're below average on the strategic fit. So this strategic imperative of the pharmaco, which is why we've called that misaligned. And then this box here is really a rethink one where um, below average on both scores, uh, which really indicates that that digital portfolio really needs to be examined and reviewed. And then we've got risky at the top left here, which is really, they're doing a reasonable job in terms of the strategic fit, but in terms of some of the venture maturity, their earlier stage ventures, higher risk, higher degree potentially of failure or not being able to deliver with that selection of ventures. So to take a look at uh, Lilly, Eli Lilly, uh, one of the top performing pharmacos, and to see what that looks like. So both strategic fit and venture score, this company does really well on. It does well in terms of its number of partnerships, 39. It does well on its uh, geographical distribution as well. Uh, a good mix of North America, Asia Pacific and Europe. And value chain, which I was mentioning earlier, also good coverage, 11 out of 12. And the key therapeutic areas, so on the right here, you can see Lily's uh, key uh, therapeutic area focus, oncology, immunology, neurology, diabetes, and pain. So for those first four, and we haven't showed every single venture here, Eli Lilly has got a very good, robust set of ventures that are strategically aligned to those four or five specific uh, areas of focus. They're also investing, uh, just as a sort of side note, in some non-core therapeutic areas. In fact, down the bottom there, Gaia, mental health company. Mental health has become, over the last year, a really key area of therapeutic focus. In fact, in the US and Europe, it's actually now the number one area of uh, investment around therapeutic area. And you can see Eli Lilly is also looking at mental health here. So that's uh, optimal. So Eli Lilly doing very well. Um, now we're going to look at this rethink area where this is suboptimal, both in terms of strategic fit uh, and venture maturity score. And here we have Biogen, um, perhaps a surprise to see a well-known company like Biogen here, but not doing quite as well on strategic fit or venture score. Only nine partnerships here, very focused in North America uh, and not distributed at all in Asia Pac, for example. Uh, value chain, not bad, eight out of 12. Their key therapeutic area of neurology, they do have coverage there, but the two in the middle here, Motognosis and Ad Scientium, Scientium, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, but those two do not rank as highly. They're around the 50 or 60 score mark out of a possible 100. So they're slightly, I wouldn't say weaker, but they're slightly kind of suboptimal versus the peer group in neurology, which has dragged down this, this venture score here and has led to Biogen being in a, in a suboptimal sort of area, in a rethink area. So just uh, getting to the end of the presentation now, just a real quick look at three interesting digital health ventures who are doing amazing work with driving partnerships with Pharmaco. So first, Chinese company uh, called Apricot, they do electronic uh, medical record analysis, very high maturity score of 81.5 out of a possible 100. Uh, all of these have done more than 10 Pharmaco partnerships. These guys have done Sanofi, Novo, Nordisk, AstraZeneca, Lilly, MSD, Abbott, and more. Then we have two uh, clinical trial companies, and perhaps no surprise that a lot of focus in clinical trial uh, from Pharmaco. So Eligo, Eligo and, and Fizi, this first company here, 78.2 uh, on the maturity score, so again, very high scoring. Uh, AstraZeneca, Lilly, Merck, Amgen, AbbVie, v Bristol Myers. And then Fizi, uh, another US company, uh, not quite as strong, 67.5, but AstraZeneca, Sanofi, Lilly, Pfizer, Novartis, Bayer, AG, Takeda, amongst others. Uh, so all three of these are doing a very uh, impactful job partnering with Pharmaco. So just drawing to, this, to, uh, to a conclusion, um, what can we draw from this? So I think the biggest, um, the biggest take out is perhaps that it's not as easy as you might think to get both of these strategic fit and the digital health maturity 
really singing and working together at the same time, uh, it's a very dynamic area, as I mentioned earlier. So things are changing all the time. So one of the key points here is to address the ever-evolving nature of digital health. Uh, clearly, as investment levels change uh, in specific digital health, you know, if a new round of investment is released, uh, there may be a pivot that the digital health company is perhaps doing that makes it less aligned to the original partnership intent with the Pharmaco. The Pharmaco's own strategy may have evolved since the partnership started, which has thrown the alignment out as well. So you know, our, our five key recommendations here really are, firstly and most importantly, be aligned to the therapeutic area and make sure that a regular portfolio analysis is being done. And when you do that analysis, um, have an impartial view as possible. Try and get to an unbiased view of that digital health venture portfolio. It's very easy to get attracted to latest digital health companies that perhaps have got a big funding round, a lot of publicity, perhaps a competitor. There's a very public partnership announcement around that. And it acts a bit like a honey jar with a lot of activity and froth. So our advice is try and step away from that and get to an impartial view and really carefully review that particular competitor, uh, sort of venture with its competitive peer set. Secondly, broad distribution of solutions across the value chain. Uh, thirdly, high potential ventures. Uh, really make sure your analytics on digital health ventures is robust and unbiased. And that's where a platform like Health Tech Alpha can really help, which assigns this score to all uh, digital health ventures impartially just based on performance. Um, fast moving market, I think I've mentioned that. And lastly, be relevant across your operating markets. Many markets, as I think everybody will realize, are often very bespoke, you know, in APAC where we're based. Um, you have very developed markets like Hong Kong and Singapore, and then you have emerging markets like Myanmar, Cambodia, Vietnam, et cetera. So very different kind of operating regulatory uh, uh, markets. So make sure that your strategy is reflecting your operating markets in your digital health selection. So that's really it. We'll take a few questions if there are, are any. Um, one thing I was going to leave you with, and I don't have the slide here for some reason, but one thing I was going to leave, leave you with is that there is a 30-page full report which goes into a lot more detail um, than which, what I've showed you. So if you head to gallangrowth.com slash research, gallangrowth.com slash research, you'll see our Pharmaceutical Innovation Index published today. It's free. Uh, so please go and download it. As well as um, Biogen and Eli Lilly, there's a much fuller list of other pharma pharmacos that have had the same analytics applied to it. So please go take a look at that. So thank you for your time. I hope you found that interesting. Um, I think we've got a few minutes. If there's any, any questions, I would be very happy to take some. Yeah. So the tool, it's Nigel Harris from the West of England Academic Health Science Network. The oh, tools you've described and the system are really excellent and I can see, you know, really will deliver value, uh, are really uh, powerful. What, what would you advise around uh, sort of early stage digital startups? So, so maybe just got the product to market, you know, looking to start to scale. You know, what, what would you say yeah. to them in, t in terms of, you know, helping them on their growth trajectory? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, I think this advice probably applies to any digital health startup that's looking to partner with a large corporation, whether that's insurer or pharma. Um, I'd say a couple of things. One is all of these organizations are really complex. Uh, there's lots of internal dynamics between global teams, regional teams, and market teams. The biggest piece of advice I would give them is find the champion, find the internal champion who will help you navigate through those Byzantine corridors internally. So that's really key. I think the second one is um, use that champion to help you find other stakeholders within the organization and really truly understand the motivations of those stakeholders and what are they looking to achieve. It sounds kind of an obvious thing, but sometimes there are you know, some strange uh, internal dynamics that are really going to make sure that you understand that piece. I think the third one is your 
digital health proposition, make sure that is super clear. Make sure also that you're looking at kind of research like this and you're really analyzing the pharmaco. What, and that's looking at annual reports and all the data you can get hold of. What really are they trying to, what problem are they trying to solve? What therapeutic area are they trying to solve? Be very, very clear about how your solution matches to that problem statement. So that's probably three key things. Yeah. Um, hi, Matt. Thank you hi. for the really interesting talk there. Pleasure. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, where do you see pharmaceutical partnerships and digital health evolving over the next couple of years? Thanks for that question. I, I, what, I hope, what we hope happens is that um, there's perhaps a more uh, dynamic way of them managing their portfolio and making regular portfolio um, evaluations impartially using some of the techniques we've outlined here to really take a step back and say is this digital health portfolio truly matching our, in, our original intent around this i'm joined here by my colleagues sarah and julian and there's some nodding heads which is great which means they can hear me julian sarah mm -hmm. anything you'd like to add to that uh, let me jump in quickly. Um, so thanks for the question. Julian Nathanabri is CEO and founder of Galen Growth, uh, based in Switzerland. Um, we, we work with a lot of pharmacos, and we're certainly hoping and expecting and have seen signs of this uh, from many of the pharmacos we're working with that um, the franchise side of pharmacos is taking a far more engaged role in digital health strategy rather than it being seen as a uh, initiative on the periphery of the core business. Um, we are certainly starting to see some of the pharmacos that we work with taking a much closer interest at their portfolio, recognizing that these have grown organically over the last five to 10 years, depending on how, um, I guess, um, precocious they were in relation to digital health in the early years of digital health. Um, and we hope that they are, and that's part of our role, um, looking at their portfolio, looking at market expectations and how those are changing, but more important, looking at how the patient journey, for example, is evolving and therefore how they best address that patient journey, not through specific one-off type relationships, which are much more akin of, to experimentation, but looking at uh, more integrated solutions uh, to address specific components of the patient journey, for example, or of the HCP journey or of the, the R&D side, depending on which piece of the value chain they, uh, they belong to. Uh, so we, we expect to see uh, smarter choices uh, and choices that are much more driven by pain points and solving those pain points in a smart way as um, Matt was um, uh, iterating earlier on. Thank you so much for that. And just quickly, another question. Um, do you plan on doing this innovation index every year from now on? I will let uh, Sarah. Sarah, do you, you. Sarah, do you want to take that one? Are we going to do the? I don't know if you heard that. Are we yeah. going to do the this every year? That is the plan. Yes, we look forward to um, to updating it and make sure that it remains current every year. Uh, and thanks, Sarah. And just to add to that, I mean, one of the interesting things that we start to do this on a year basis, we're going to see trends emerging. Um, how dynamic are pharmacos reacting to changing market circumstances and innovation in the marketplace, et cetera. So I think it's going to be very interesting looking at this score going forward. Thank I think you, it's Matthew. worth adding as well that we'll look at other verticals too. So Matt, um, I know, has uh, voiced interest in looking at the insurers and payers and seeing how they're looking at their portfolios. So um, we'll learn from this report and the feedback we get and uh, we'll look at uh, look at other verticals in the quarter 2022. Yeah, thank you, Matthew. A question from me. Um, I'm particularly interested in complementary therapies and comorbidities, for example, diabetes or cardiovascular with, with mental health conditions. Is this an area which is very important for the AHSNs and also the NHS and the other areas to actually manage comorbidities more effectively because the cost of a diabetes patient with anxiety and stress is some, some like three times more than than somebody just with diabetes alone. Do you see complementary therapy research and collaboration growing, or is it an area which pharma are a little bit cautious about? Uh, Julian, would you like to take that one? I don't know, actually, I'll ask Sarah to take that one, but I will add to, to what Sarah has to say on, on a slightly related topic. But Sarah, do you want, do you want to 
uh, address that question? I know you've been looking at it very closely lately. Sure. Yeah, it's a good question. And um, at Galen Growth, we also do con, um, consulting work with our clients, and we have seen clients coming to us asking for the those comorbidities and those um, having having as well. Not only once the patient is diagnosed with the first uh, disease, then having the additional um, therapy areas come in to make sure that the whole patient is addressed, yes. So the only two things I would add to that very quickly is we're also seeing more mature ventures moving into or recognizing comorbidity and therefore all moving from say diabetes into cardiovascular. One drop is an example of that in the US, for example. Uh, on a vaguely related comorbidity level, we're seeing quite a few pharma codes also looking at mental health state of patients that are on or affected by a particular chronic disease. Uh, if you look at Lily's profile that Matt was showing earlier on, you'll see that Eli Lilly is looking at mental health quite closely, despite it not being a core therapeutic area for them, but because, of course, cancer patients are in need of support. Thank you very much, um, everybody. Thank you, uh, Matthew, for, for being here today. I just want to remind everybody, um, gallangrowth.com research is where this very comprehensive report will be. And also, thank you, Matthew, for being such a detailed and insightful presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, too. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to uh, day two of Giant Health. And today I'd like to, and this morning I'd like to introduce Alex from Cognitant. And what happens, is the question, what happens when somebody's diagnosed with an illness? Unfortunately, they go straight to Dr. Google, they get all the wrong information, and we need to intercept that and find a better way. So Alex will explain to us how, with her Healthy Note platform and Cognizant, she can educate uh, patients better and actually um, get to a better solution with the, with the GPs and the, and the whole medical journey. So over to you, Alex. Thank you. So hi, everyone. Yes, I'm Alex Merckx, and I'm the Director of Marketing and Partnerships at Cognizant. Um, and today I want to explore the question, can avatars play a role in the future of healthcare? Um, now I chose this topic because at Cognitant we make a lot of use of avatars um, for our patient education programs. Um, and I thought it would be useful today to explore um, a little bit what we've learned so far um, and also whether we think that avatars could be part of a positive solution for the healthcare services of the future. So. We'll look at, um, first of all, why do we need to consider innovations for healthcare? Are innovations needed? Also, if we look at innovations that are happening in healthcare, um, what are the ones that are using avatar technology already? And then, perhaps most importantly, is there any evidence for avatars being able to deliver a positive impact on healthcare? But just to backtrack a little bit, first of all, um, when I was preparing for this talk, I started to wonder what thoughts people might already have on the subject. Um, and therefore, I followed a very unscientific approach. And I asked a few friends the question without giving them any context at all. I asked them, do you think avatars could play a role in the future of healthcare? And they came back to me mostly with just lots of questions. And the first question that they asked was, what's an avatar? And so I thought that that was actually a very good question that we should cover off first of all. Um, so an avatar is a digital representation of a character. So you can see examples of avatars here on the screen and you'll have come across some of them already before in your daily lives. So avatars can, become, can be used in social media. Um, they're found on chatbots. Um, there's some virtual events that are making use of avatars now. And of course, people have a lot of fun playing with avatars um, in computer games. So these are all quite sort of simple examples of avatars, but avatars can also exist in a very sort of more complex and sophisticated way. And we'll talk about some of those in a bit. The next question that I had from my friends were, but what will the avatar do? You know, are they going to do my surgery? Are they going to take my blood tests? Am I just going to have a nice chat with them? So I thought that that was a really good question as well. And we'll cover that off um, in a little while. We'll have a, a look at examples where avatar technology is already being used in healthcare. But I wanted to share, first of all, the next sort of statement that was the most common statement amongst my friends after that. And that was, 
I'm afraid that I'm rather traditional and I like to see real people. And my response to that would be, yes, of course. You know, we know that 70% of people still trust their healthcare professional above anyone else to give them reliable health advice. Um, you know, our doctors and nurses are the very bedrock of our health services, and without them, they would crumble. But I think it's also important to recognize um, that our health services are on under a lot of strain, um, and this is happening across the globe. So let's have a look at a little bit more detail around that global um, growing strain that we're seeing with our healthcare services. We're living in an aging population. We're expected now to live to an average age of 81. And the Office of National Statistics has said that by 2035, 25% of the world's population will be in the over 65 cohort. Meanwhile, the number of people who are being diagnosed with four or more long-term conditions will double from 2015 to 2035. And the result is that clinicians are under a lot of strain. They're seeing patients with multiple long-term conditions, with polypharmacy, set within an underfunded um, infrastructure, and they're time poor. On average, a GP, for example, um, gets to see a patient in the consultation for about 10 minutes. So the result is a lot of clinicians, unfortunately, are leaving the profession. Um, in the UK, for example, we have 1,800 less GPs than we did in 2015. A few more statistics to share with you. Um, in 2013, the, wealth, the World Healthcare, or the World Health Organization, warned that there will be a shortfall of 12.9 million healthcare workers globally by 2035. And the medical futurist has mentioned that over half of the world's population is lacking access to essential healthcare. So I think we can all agree that there is a need for some sort of solution and innovations to help relieve that pressure on our health services. But the question is, can avatars play a part in that solution? Well, um, there's research that suggests that it potent they potentially could. Shafi et al, for example, in 2015, said that those who receive tailored guidance and advice from avatars appear to have better physical and psychosocial outcomes as the digital characters can be customized for cultural, social, and other user preferences. But in that case, if we're going to use avatars, to go back to my friend's question, what will the avatar do? So we can have a look at a few examples where um, avatar technology is already being used in healthcare. So in surgery, for example, um, avatar technology is being used to convert patients into avatars on the computer. And this is allowing for surgeons to carry out surgery with unprecedented precision. Um, and in brain and spine, in, uh, spine surgery, for example, it's allowing for surgery that before wasn't possible because of navigational issues. Of course, this is also really helpful for training in surgery. The Visual Human Project is helping to create these types of avatars. Um, they have made publicly available, anatomically accurate 3D representations of the human body, um, both in the male and female form. And then we have digital twin technology, which is being used in a number of industries. And within the healthcare industry, it's allowing for patient data to be collated. Um, a real breadth of data, including um, information on the genetic makeup of a person from genome sequencing. And of course, by building up this digital model of a patient, you can then apply AI technology, you can run simulations, and you can start to design a really res a personalized response to, to their healthcare. And then we've got medical records. IBM, for example, is using avatar technology to, visualize, vis to show visual representations of certain location-specific areas um, in the patient record. And then we have patient education, which is the area that we're in at Cognitant. And this is where companies are taking advantage of the fact that avatars can be engaging, they can be fun, they bring a human touch to information, um, they're available 24-7, they can speak multiple languages, et cetera. Icare Navigator have created avatar nurses that give information to patients within the hospital. They can give information, guidance, encouragement, 
and they can be accessed on phones and um, iPads and on the, on the hospital TV. And their work was inspired by Boston University School of Medicine that ran some research where they developed some virtual nurses to coach patients on information such as how to take medication. And their research found that in fact, 74% of patients preferred to receive discharge instructions from a virtual nurse instead of a human. And then we have Cognitant. Um, and at Cognitant, we're developing avatar-led engaging, interactive, visual, vi visual education for, for patients. And we do that in order to give patients deeper understanding of their conditions and treatments. So ultimately, we're looking to help people better understand and manage their health to ultimately drive better health outcomes for them. And our patient education programs can be viewed on someone on a phone, on, an, on a tablet, and also a number of our programs can be watched in virtual reality. So the big question is, are these all gimmicks or can they genuinely deliver a positive impact on healthcare? Well, in order to answer this question, we can have a look at a, a few examples of programs that we've run at Cognitant where we've, we've measured some, some of, the, of the impact. So I can talk to you first of all about a program that we ran um, for patients with chronic kidney disease. We developed this with the Royal Berkshire NHS Foundation Trust. And first of all, to give you a bit of background, the challenge that we were trying to face was three million people approximately in the UK have chronic kidney disease. A lot of them find it really difficult to understand the information that they're given about their condition. And therefore, unfortunately, it's leading to avoidable complications, progressions, and therefore an impact on the, their quality of life. And then, then meanwhile, the clinicians just don't have the time, sufficient time to, to give that additional information that would make a difference. So the solution that we came up with was this avatar-led um, education program. And it was looking to educate people on understanding um, diagnosis, understanding the staging and to look and to help them look after their renal health with the ultimate aim of reducing avoidable complications and also helping to reduce demand on on resources so we wanted to measure the impact of this educational program versus giving a traditional form of education in text so we actually also designed the same information but in traditional text format with accompanying um, um, graphs. And I'm just going to pause there for a second um, to share a, a video. It's quite a quick video, but hopefully it'll give you a taster of what the program looked like. Ah, you can't sound. It's normally got music, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> ah. was rather quick but um, hopefully it gives you a flavor of what the program looked like. So um, the pilot that I mentioned was run for one year with two test groups. There was one set of patients that received the traditional form of education in written format and then there was one group that received the avatar-led education. This graph um, represents some of the results from this. The blue bar represents the people who received the written format, and the orange bar represents the people who received the avatar-led education. And you can see that the group that received the avatar-led education reported a better improvement in their knowledge about their chronic kidney disease. Um, they also said that it was easier um, 
to find the content, they found it easier to understand it. Um, and 100% of the people would recommend um, the avatar-led education to a friend. Um, a GP who made use of sharing this information with, the, with their patients with chronic kidney disease said that this provides high-tech, high-quality information, making it more accessible to patients that struggle with literacy. And then just to sort of complete the story about this particular program, after one year, um, the program, I'm pleased to say, is still being used. And we're now translating it into Nepalese, Urdu, Punjabi, and Polish. Um, we're applying cultural adaptation, and we're applying also additional subject areas around acute kidney disease. Now, um, to move on to another case study. Um, this is an avatar-led piece of education to teach children about um, how to use their adrenaline auto-injector. Um, and this was run um, as part of a research study with Cardiff University. In this case, the avatar was a furry cat called Fismo. So again, to give you a bit of background, first of all, anaphylaxis is the most severe form of an allergic reaction and it's life-threatening. At least one in 40 children in the UK are suffering from at least one serious allergy. Now children are normally trained about how to use their adrenaline auto-injector by a nurse face to face, but of course with COVID-19 that um, enforced some limitations. And therefore the group at Cardiff University were really interested in looking into whether there was potential for using an interactive avatar-led video to help carry that training out remotely instead. So again, we carried out a, um, a study um, and, in, and again with two groups. Um, one group of children received the avatar um, interactive video with FISMO and the other group received um, the traditional form of education with, um, led by a nurse. And the groups were assessed um, after their tra training with the following. They were asked to identify whether they could place the auto-injector or the pen on the thigh, um, whether they knew how to use a fist grip around the pen, um, whether they knew to remove the blue safety cap, um, use the place and press technique until they heard the pen click and whether they knew that they then had to hold it in place for three seconds. And then the group who received the avatar-led education with FISMO were also asked to um, answer these questions with a range of smiley and unsmiley faces. And it was, uh, the questions were, do you enjoy? Did you enjoy watching the video? Did you like how it looked? Did you learn anything? Do you feel you know how to use your auto-injector now? And would you watch more videos like this? And to show you some of the results, so this is uh, around the competence assessment. You can see the graph on the right-hand side. The blue bar represents the people who received the interactive video with FISMO, and the orange bar represents the people who received um, the, the traditional form of education with the, with the nurse. And you can see that for all the competences, the video with, with FISMO um, was at least as good. And you can see in certain areas, it actually, uh, there was better response um, with the video. Um, in particular, for the assessment of the criteria of whether they, could, they knew to hold um, the pen in place for three seconds, uh, there was a much better result with the group that had followed the interactive video with FISMO. And then in terms of the questions that had been asked to the group that had seen um, the avatar-led education with FISMO, you can see that 100% of the children said that they really enjoyed watching the video, they really liked how it looked, and 96% of them said that they'd like to watch more videos like that, for example, to see information on how to carry out first aid. Um, this is a nice quote from Dr. Ta David Tuthill, who was the consultant pediatrician as part of the research study. And he said that being able to improve your chil the chil how children recall the information they are given is transformational. And I just want to end on one final note, and that's around the question around the different versions of avatars. Avatars can exist in different formats. They can appear as within 2D animations, they can appear as 3D models, but still viewed on a screen, and they can exist as, uh, as, as 3D models that are viewed within a virtual reality environment with, with VR goggles. 
Um, is there a preference between, between them? Now, there is some research that suggests that a truly immersive experience following education using VR goggles does offer some benefit in terms of memory recall and helping to enforce, um, a, a encourage a, a sort of uh, user, be user behavior. Um, Arne S.J. et al., for example, has said that gamification, virtual avatars, and using immersive technologies like virtual and augmented reality are increasingly being shown to have the ability to change user behavior. And meanwhile, Krokos et al. Um, talk about how immersion using virtual reality headsets allows viewers to create what they call memory palaces and can increase fact recall. And on the left-hand side, the visuals that I've shown here are actually visuals from a research project that we carried out in Columbia with Oxford Brookes University and with the University Hospital of Bogota in Colombia. And we ran some research carrying out a pro um, developing an avatar-led program, educational program for, for people with diabetes. We prepared the education in three different formats, 2D animation, 3D, but still viewed on the screen, and then 3D avatars with, set within a, a, a VR immersive environment. And the overall result was that patients did actually say that they preferred the, the VR experience and felt that they, they recalled more information from that. So to conclude, so my question at the beginning was, can avatars play a role in the future of healthcare? And my answer would be that I think that they can. I think this is because um, avatars have characteristics that we have proven um, we can ex exploit positively. Um, they're available 24-7, they can speak multiple languages, they can integrate into existing systems, and they can be used by anyone, anytime, in any place. And that means that we can provide information and education in a really accessible and engaging way. Um, to respond again to my friend's comment of they prefer to see humans, this is not about replacing our amazing doctors and nurses. But I do believe that avatars can be symbiotic with traditional healthcare services. So to conclude, I believe that with careful user-centric thought, avatars can create supportive, accessible, and meaningful interaction that will help to relieve pressures on our healthcare services across the globe. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, thank you, that was very clear and persuasive, and I, I'm, I've, I've no doubt that avatars are, are, are very effective means of communication. I'm just interested in knowing a little bit more about the study that you did with the Royal Berkshire around the numbers of uh, patients that you looked at over that 12 months, whether you looked at uh, a cross-section of demographics, because you know, maybe younger or older people prefer information in this way, and whether you actually looked at information uh, retreat, um, uh, retention. So you, you said you did surveys around whether people liked it, but you didn't give any data around whether people actually retained more information. So did yeah. you do any tests around knowledge retention? So that's a really good question. And um, in terms of not um, numbers involved, I think I might refer to my uh, our, um, CEO here, who's Dr. Tim Ringrose, and he was involved in in, in a little bit more detail about that research. So. Yeah, thanks. We had um, something like 200 patients involved. Um, the chronic kidney disease is generally a disease that affects older people. Uh, we did have some younger people. Uh, what we found was some of the people in the older categories uh, had a little bit of hesitancy uh, and sometimes needed their family to help them access the information. Uh, but once they got over that hurdle, they really found it easy to use and felt comfortable using it. We haven't yet done any studies looking at um, recall of information in that particular study, but it's something that we plan to do. And as you can see, we're now converting into different languages to try to, try to address some of the, the groups uh, who's, for whom English isn't their first language. And as, as you probably know, that there's quite a high incidence of renal failure in some of those groups. So, we, but that's a really good, good, good thing for us to test, which we'll make sure we add in. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. Hi, thank you very much. That was a really, really um, well put together presentation. And it's excellent to see that the issues in terms of we can see, I think it was by 
2035, there's going to be 18,000 less GPs and quite a considerable number um, in healthcare professionals. It's, it's, it's going to reduce. So, of course, avatars and such likes are a really strong way forward. It was excellent to understand um, the engagement, the patient engagement with avatars. Um, and we're just wondering here, so you said there um, that currently you are localising and translating into different languages to really engage that group of patients mm. that English isn't their first language. Um, it'd be great to understand a little bit more around how you're doing that and you know what that looks like. Is there any feedback in terms of, um, excuse me, the patient engagement with um, the, community, the ethnic minority groups? Excuse me. <laughs> That English isn't their first language. Yeah, well, we're, I think it's sort of common knowledge that health literacy is a problem. Um, and we find that I think it's around about 45% uh, of people who truly have the health literacy to understand the typical patient information leaflet that you're given. A lot of the problem is often that people are given information in a, in a language that is not their first language as well. You know, for example, in the UK, we have so many languages spoken and typically people are given information just in English and that's what that's what I meant in terms of one of the benefits of avatars is that you can translate them so easily they can speak in multiple languages and that's why for example with with the um, chronic kidney disease program we're now translating in, into those four additional languages at the moment we're working on a basis of you know where we requested it where it's commissioned we will we, we carry out the the um the translation but we'd love in the future for us to you know have the capability and technology to be able to just offer all languages for all programs just automatically do you anticipate do you anticipate sort of using avatars, you know, from just informa accessing information to sort of more behavior change, coaching, sort of care management um, outside of sort of accessing information? Do you mean in terms of providing care to a particular patient? Yes, I, I think sort of, um, yes, from a more care management perspective. So, for example, that the chronic kidney disease, um, not just, you know, probably the first level being, do you have access to information knowing your condition, but then how are they implementing it in taking ownership of it and monitoring it yeah i mean certainly that's another area that we're very interested at, at looking into we'd love to sort of bring in sort of um remote monitoring and to gather information from the patient both sort of you know ask them to respond to certain questions about how they're managing their care um you know potentially with remote monitoring you can sort of gather a lot of data and we'd love to be in the position to then respond to that data by triggering notifications of really personalized health information along the patient journey, which I think can help a lot in terms of the preventative medicine. Thank you, Alex. That's a fantastic, very um, memorable and accessible and impactful presentation, <laughs> which I think all of your stuff does. Question Thank for you. me, do you work with uh, charities and pharmaceutical companies in preparing this sort of, this uh, health liter literacy? Yeah. Um, Co-creation is really, really important to us. So it's not about just us sitting in an ivory tower and creating education on our own. Um, we always follow a very robust co-creation process where we bring in patients, we bring in clinicians, you know, all the stakeholders that are important to helping design a, a patient education program that's truly going to be impactful and make a difference to the patient. Brilliant. So I think in conclusion, we can say that can avatars play a role in uh in the future of healthcare, so resounding yes. So thank you, Alex, and uh, from Cognizant. So we're going to take a. Thank you. A, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I think next time you become with your avatar, won't you? Not personally, right? So Hello, everybody, and welcome back. Um, we have an exciting five companies from SAP.io program incubation, and I'd like to welcome the first of these companies, Orbiter, to join us virtually now. Hi, over to you. Hello, I'm Patty Riskin, and I am the CEO of Orbita, and Orbita is a, a conversational AI company, and we use virtual assistants to help automate workflows, improve outcomes, and make life more efficient for healthcare. And can I ask, can everyone see the slide that I'm sharing? 
if I can get any feedback. Well, I'm going for it. So today I'm going to talk to you about Beyond the Bot, using virtual assistants to help engage patients with conversational AI. And today we know that healthcare consumers want the same thing that every other consumer wants, instant gratification to feel known, to have a streamlined, personalized experience when engaging with the healthcare system. And they want interactions that are going to work and be simple and straightforward. As during COVID, we've realized that digital solutions have been the uh, in high demand and that healthcare organizations have had to in, use things like telehealth and virtual visits to see patients when they couldn't see them in person. So we saw an increase of 38 times the number of visits being used, turning into virtual assistants and telehealth. And during COVID, other digital solutions were used that consumers and patients really liked, and they don't want those solutions to go away. And today, 75% of consumers believe that their healthcare encounters should be like an Uber experience or open table or other online experiences that allow them to gain access and to use the healthcare system in a way that's easy online and instant. And we also know that virtual assistants can address approximately 80% of routine tasks like scheduling an appointment, symptom triage, finding a doctor or a location. So the key today is really taking advantage of virtual assistants to help make navigating healthcare easier. Our intention is to help improve access and timeliness of care, streamline outreach and awareness building and education, allow for enhanced adherence and compliance to treatment protocols, and ultimately making the life of those who work in healthcare easier by letting processes and systems be much more efficient. If you think of the entire care continuum, there are multiple points of friction from the front end in terms of gaining awareness and education about how to utilize the healthcare system through the actual utilization of health, whether that's in an inpatient or an outpatient setting, and post visit or post discharge from an ongoing maintenance, monitoring, and main, maintain, maintenance of health. There are ways that we can improve the process. And virtual assistants help do that. Text, email, voice, and chatbots. Healthcare systems can help connect the dots between points of interaction across the care journey. And using these different omni-channel approaches, we help healthcare organizations act with systems of record like SAP or um, electronic health record systems or CRMs, pulling data out, engaging with someone across the care journey at these different touch points, and ultimately helping them reach a conclusion. And that may be taking action or that may be engaging with, with the healthcare system in a virtual way. There's any number of use cases that, uh, that can leverage different technologies in order to get things to work. So the virtual assistant solutions are really designed to help decrease implementation time, improve the patient experience, engage those patients along the journey, and enhance the workflow so that the burden on staff is minimized. So some specific examples of virtual assistants are symptom triage. And this is something that was definitely leveraged during COVID and continues to be, where Someone could go to a website, engage with a chatbot, ask specific questions or put in what their symptoms are and get either reassurance or directed to the right place to help address the issues that they're facing. Finding a location or a provider is often difficult. And so whether it's through a chatbot or through outreach, if someone you know, can receive a bi-directional text asking them for where a primary care physician is located or providing characteristics that they're looking for, whether it's where someone went to medical school or their gender, or if they treat a certain of, of condition, 
as well as online review information. All of that can be incorporated into a virtual assistant that allows making a finding of a physician or a location so much easier. Appointment scheduling is also a point of friction in the healthcare system. And when an order is placed by a physician for a patient to see, say, a particular specialist or make a certain type of appointment, say a colonoscopy, if a patient were to receive a text that would say, validate the, who they are, and then take them through a process of easily scheduling an appointment, picking a location, the time they want, and then walking them through all the pre-surgical prep or pre-procedure prep so they know what to expect, when to show up, and then if they run into a conflict and have to reschedule, it's easily done all through an interaction with the virtual assistant. Of course, there's the need to occasionally see uh, or, or actually talk to a live human being. And a virtual assistant where you might engage with a chatbot or a text, email, or through voice using interactive voice response or a, a smart speaker, ability for a virtual assistant to understand and to interpret what someone's saying so they recognize when to escalate to a live human. So for example, you don't want someone to get so frustrated with the interaction and then suggest, but a good virtual assistant anticipates. So based on how someone is speaking or what they're typing into the interface, they can recognize, oh, I think you need to talk to a human being and then bring someone into that chat or onto the line for click to call in order to take care of that patient. We also can recognize when somebody's having an, you know, an incident such as I feel chest pain or I think I'm gonna pass out, they can instantly escalate to a human being to help them engage. Registering people for programs. So I know health systems do a lot of outreach to engage with specific types of patients with conditions or for fitness, any number of things as it relates to maintaining health as well as addressing certain chronic conditions, we can enlist people by in integrating forms, uh, videos, uh, pamphlets, all kinds of content into a virtual assistant that can engage and sign up for follow-up. On the marketing front, we're using virtual assistants to help address and bring in new patients. So for example, a QR code can be part of a billboard or any kinds of kind of advertisement where if someone, for example, needs a mammogram or a colonoscopy, they can use their phone. We all got used to using QR codes during COVID to draw them in, fill out a number of you know, relevant questions to make sure that they're appropriate for whatever is being promoted and sign them up. Similar to the program registration, we can sign them up for different uh, visits or different types of uh, screening programs. We also can create conversational banner ads. So instead of just a regular banner ad that you click on and it takes you through, it's actually a bot which can engage with someone and get real information about what they're looking for, who they are, what insurance they have, and then figure out the appropriate way to triage. So the return on investment from this type of marketing is easily measured and impactful. Remote patient monitoring is another application for virtual assistants where it's doing outreach. In this case, we're showing an echo and it could be through a smart speaker such as Alexa or Google or just the telephone using IVR or it can be email or text where it's checking in on a patient, making sure they're staying compliant with their treatment protocol. And it can also be connected with the internet of things, such as scales or monitors. For example, we're integrated with Medtronic's pacemaker application. So if something goes awry, we can reach out to that patient, understand how they're feeling, and take appropriate next steps if they need to be escalated to see their doctor or go to the emergency room. With virtual assistants, we have seen real success in terms of automating workflows, reducing costs, and improving experience. 75 to 85% of the time, we are effective in engaging with a user. So we'll use an omni-channel approach to do outreach 
trying first with phone. And if we can't reach someone, then text, then email, or whatever order works for that particular user. And as a result, we have high engagement, which then leads to high conversions. 97% of the time when someone inter interacts with the virtual assistant, they end up completing what was intended, whether that's scheduling an appointment, understanding the educational information that we're sharing, or taking action in terms of escalating to a live agent or making sure that there's follow through from a remote patient monitoring perspective. We had one patient saved over $2 million in terms of what you, the, you, their use case with the virtual assistant. Um, they did call center deflection and were able to save over 15 full-time employees because the virtual assistant was able to address those common questions and not have to in, utilize a live person through the call center. The customers that Orbita works with range across providers, payers, life science, and med tech. We have a number of different organizations that are using us for a variety of use cases, many of which I shared today, and uh, are taking advantage of a digital approach to help improve efficiencies and effectiveness. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share the story of Orbita and virtual assistants with you today. And if you have any questions, here's my email. Thank you so much. Thank you, Patty, for the uh, great presentation. I'm not sure if you can hear me, but uh, thank you for explaining uh, Orbita to us. Next on line is Vias Analytics, which is another company from the SAP IO Foundry and Incubator program, and uh, they do deep uh, analytics for the healthcare sector. And I'll pass over to Viasa coming from uh, Boston right now. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome back um, to the SAP IO showcase. And next on uh, the stage, we have Check It, Nikki San, Head of Growth, all the way from Nigeria. Thank you. All right, um, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Isikan, and I'm head of growth at Checkit. So Checkit is an anti-counterfeit and consumer intelligence product. Um, so, yeah. so imagine a loved one or someone you know dying from consuming um, fake products or drugs in the market. Over the years, we hear countless stories of people that have died from consuming drugs that they thought by taking it, they were going to get better, or just products that you know they just wanted to consume. According to WHO, um, shows that over 100,000 people die every year in West Africa because of counterfeit anti-malarial medicine. In addition to like the cost of lives, um, the human the human tragic cost of lives, this has also caused losses in commercial. Has also caused some form of commercial losses. It said that over about 40,000 products in FMCG, the fast moving consumer goods products and pharmaceutical products are counterfeit. So imagine basically we're saying that at least companies are losing about 40% of their market share to counterfeit products in the market. This has also led to over $300 billion in losses every year to businesses. So now this is where Check It comes in. Check It is, um, Check It has created a, a disruptive software, a disruptive anti-counterfeit and consumer intelligence software that has, that has basically been created to solve the problem of anti-counterfeit in the markets. Let me show you how this works. So using our dashboard, basically what you do is a manufacturer can create unique IDs for products and our system then logs the identity on the FTM blockchain ledger. The unique IDs are then converted to QR codes, which are added to the packaging labels for all the products placed on the shelves. So consumers basically walk into the stores, they see the QR code and they can either scan the code or they can use the USSD platform. So either for whatever reasons that they decide to, either they don't have a camera phone or they don't have internet. So they can then use the USSD code. Once they do this, they automatically get 
um, response to show the verification of the product, to show the authenticity of the product. Furthermore, manufacturers can kind of set survey questions on this platform as well. So when consumers actually scan the products after checking the verification of the products, they can also answer some survey questions that the manufacturers have set. What this does is it bridges the gap between the manufacturers and the consumers, and consumers then get to give um, the direct feedback to the manufacturers, which has never actually really been done before. I mean, yes, we know that manufacturers send out surveys from time to time on how um, companies feel about their products, but they've actually never really had live feedback there and then at the point of purchase when the consumers are getting the product. So this is just a visual representation of the consumers walking to a store, picking up a product, scanning it, and getting instant feedback. So all these services are under one of our products, which is called the Consumer Intelligence Product. And right now we're running a pilot on um, our machine learning, sorry, on our image recognition tool, which uses machine learning um, to identify fake packages on this shelf simply by taking a picture of it. So now you don't necessarily have to scan the products using the QR code or using the USSD. You can actually take a picture of the product and upload it on our platform and you can get instant um, feedback on the product. So check it is actually a it's a B2B model. So by this I mean we actually the manufacturers are actually the ones that pay for the products and not the consumers. So the consumers get to use the products for free. We currently offer two primary products, the consumer intelligence and the machine learning image recognition, which I just spoke about that's currently running through a pilot phase right now. Since Check It launched in 2018, we've grown by over 3,000% since its launch. Um, Check It has saved its clients up to 70% cost, and only about 5% of that 70% cost is um, Check It's cost. To date, our QR codes have been distributed to more than 30 million products in Nigeria across the pharmaceutical industry and the FMCG. So up here, I just have a visual representation of one product representing one particular industry. So glucophage, which is under Merck, um, representing the pharmaceutical industry and Amazing Day, which is a product from Flower Mills, a company back in Nigeria, um, representing the FMCG. Basically just showing that Check It covers pharmaceuticals and FMCGs as well. We've also been able to protect, survey, and engage over 300,000 customers through our platform. And as I mentioned earlier, one of our biggest clients in the pharma space being Merck today, which is currently rolling us out on over 7 million products in the market. We've also been able to raise over $600,000 in equity and grants. And we have over, and yeah, sorry, we've been able to roll out over, uh, we've been able to raise um, over $600,000 in equity and grants. We have about 18,000 pharma, pharma distributors and FMCG manufacturers in Africa, and they generate over $1 trillion um, revenue. Sorry. Okay, so sorry, technical glitch. <laughs> okay, so today we're happy to announce our partnership with SAP. Um, we'll be partnering with SAP to explore, to expand our businesses across the shores of Africa and Middle East. Um, so one of the things that we're doing with SAP is basically leveraging on the SAP's serialization and ATTP solution to put in our consumer intelligence solution and our anti-counterfeit solution for customers to identify original and fake products in the markets. So consumers could also use this mechanism, manufacturers rather could also use this mechanism to engage with brands and to engage with consumers and consumers in turn use this platform to engage with manufacturers directly to get insights. So like I'd mentioned, we're going to be working with SAP to expand across Africa and Middle East, but we're also going to be working with, um, we're also open to working globally as well. We're compliant with GS, GS1 standard and offer country-specific compliance to CMOs. So this is our core management team. Our core management team comprises of a um, bunch of professionals, business professionals with previous startup experiences and experiences in the 
um, banking sector as well as other IT, co um, IT corporations in Nigeria. Together with our board of advisors, we've combined over 20 plus years of experience in the FMCG and pharmaceutical space. Just give me a minute to look at these beautiful faces. <laughs> so if you know of any large pharmaceutical industries or FMCGs, that are skeptical about um, their products running the risk of um, going into counterfeit or just are just just basically want to eliminate counterfeit products and regain their market share that has been lost to counterfeit in a product, please reach out to us um, or speak to us at the E3 booth, or you can speak to us right after this session. Um, if you also, um, yes, so if you're also aware of other investors as well, that's looking into expanding um, into other shows of, into Africa and other parts of the world as well, and would be interested in this sort of businesses, we'll be happy to speak to them about our upcoming $3 million seed round. But yeah, that's it from me. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, Nikisa, from me, thank you for the great presentation. and. This counterfeit uh, drugs and, and consumer products, is it prevalent in different regions outside of Africa as well, or is it most prevalent in Africa? Um, it's most prevalent in Africa at the moment. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Great. Well, if uh, go to E3 booth, you said, didn't you? Yes. Go to, to meet, check it, and if you have 300, 3 million pounds to invest, that's the, <laughs> that's the place to go without counterfeit money, please. Thank so. you. Next we uh, we move from uh, nigeria to curitiba brazil we are I'd like to welcome uh, christian who is ceo of laura care which is a very innovative um, patient monitoring and uh, integrated care relationship platform so over to you christian well thank you very much uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank you to thank uh, SAP for the invitation for being here. Um, so we are startup from Brazil, and we are of one of the main health techs in the Brazilian market. And for us, it's a it's a great pleasure being here and looking all the opportunities that we have in Europe in the in the UK. Um, I'm going to tell you a story of our journey in Brazil and how Laura become one of the most important startups in healthcare in Brazil um, and how we started. Uh, first of all, uh, we know that healthcare uh, has many problems worldwide. We know that data is built on silos. We know that there are many inefficiencies. We know that there, there are many troubles for the healthcare team, for physicians, for nurses to uh, make all the care coordination. And this happens worldwide. This happens in the hospitals. This happens on the primary care. And um, this is uh, this is, uh, some estimates from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that more than 8 million people die every year for mistakes in the healthcare. And this can happen by many different reasons. And apart from that, more than $1 trillion are wasted every year because of mistakes in healthcare. So there are a lot of people dying and we are wasting a lot of money because we, can't, we cannot have in, uh, efficient uh, healthcare systems. And when we look in the healthcare perspective, what we have is that we have many uh, data that are built uh, on silos. We have many different systems that don't talk to each other. And we see the physicians and the nurses going around trying to connect all this workflow, trying to connect the data. And it's very hard to, It's very hard for them. And it makes it very hard for the patients as well. So um, the, 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 the question is how we can connect this data, how we can uh, make easy to the physicians and to the nurse to promote good healthcare and quality healthcare. And um, particularly, I'm not from the healthcare background, I'm, I'm from the tech area, I'm a computer scientist, and uh, I, I, my focus is always, was always on artificial intelligence. And I got to know the problems in the healthcare industry when, on 2016, I got to know my other co-founder, and he told me the story on how he lost his daughter with 18 days of life in one hospital in our city. 
uh, his daughter was uh, having a clinical deterioration in the hospital and the healthcare team took a really long time to notice that she was having a clinical deterioration. And when they did notice, it was already too late. She was in uh, sepsis shock and she died within a few hours. When he told, uh, told me this story, we started to look uh, in Brazil for the perspectives, if that, that was a, a, an accident, if that, that was an isolated mistake, or, it, or if it happened often. And we found out that actually it happens often, and not only in Brazil, but worldwide. So in 2016, we decided to start a project with the name of Laura, which is the name of his daughter, to avoid that other parents would suffer the same struggle that he did in 2016. And the, our main vision was to use uh, data, to use artificial intelligence to empower the healthcare team to provide a better healthcare. Um, we started in 2016 with a vision of uh, the patient inside the hospital and providing a clinical decision system that's connected to the electronic health record in real time and is able to connect the patient to the best healthcare service available, giving alerts to the healthcare team of what are the patients at risk. And we started in one hospital in 2016, and now we have more than 50 customers uh, in many different regions of Brazil, and we are in the entire patient journey. Since primary care, um, hospital settings, and post-treatment as well, the main idea is simple. As the data is built on silos, as the hospitals, they are not, this data is not connected to uh, payers. Um, basically, what you do is connecting this data and building a 360 vision of the patient. And after that, we can connect this data to intelligence and to different applications to empower the patients on looking for the best care and empower the physicians and the nurses as well on providing the best care. So that's how we do it. Uh, nowadays, we have we have monitored more, we have analyzed more than 10 million medical records. We have one of the biggest uh, data sets in Brazil, in the healthcare industry, probably one of the biggest in Latin America as well. And with this the data set, with this big data set, we can provide many different types of applications. The one that I, sh I will show you right now is, uh, I will show you two. Uh, I will show you LauraCare, which is a, uh, it's a platform for patient uh, remote monitoring. And afterwards, I will show you the Laura Clinical uh, Intelligence. That's the system for monitoring the patients in the hospital. And you see that the idea is simple. It's basically uh, connecting the data to, to the physicians and to the patients as well. So this is LauraCare. Uh, as I as I told you, Laura Case is a system that can be used um, in the in the back office of many healthcare institutions, and we connect this data to the patient and to the physician. So the patient can uh, triage can 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 make a triage. The pa the patient can input his or her symptoms, uh, and this can be done on WhatsApp. This can be done on many apps. Laura is an intelligence that can connect all this different information and connect the patient based on the symptoms that the patient has um, with the doctor, with the physician. And if the patient is at a uh, high risk, Laura can uh, follow the patient uh, directly to the hospital and the healthcare team will know about it. So imagine that all with all of this data, the healthcare team, the physicians and the nurses, they will have access, they will have full access to all the clinical history, history of this patient. Uh, they will know what this patient reported. They will know what is the outcome of that patient. And that's the, how we do it with, with artificial intelligence. So imagine that what we, we are doing is to uh, make the healthcare digital with the hospitals and with the healthcare payers as well. All the data from the patient, all the information will be centralized in just one place. Um, and with that, you can have clinical insights, you can have uh, many different informations, and um, we can empower the healthcare team to take the best decisions. And now I show you uh, Laura Clinical Intelligence, which is the system uh, that's connected for in-hospital settings and is connected to the EMR. And in real time, we can take data 
from vital signs, from lab exams, all the clinical history of the patient. And as we have more than 10 million medical records, Laura is able to predict what patients uh, are the highest, 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 highest risk of clinical deterioration. So imagine that, as, as Laura knows, uh, what, what are the clinical pathways, uh, we have much better specific, specificity and sensitivity to better identify patients at risk. So basically what we do for in-hospital settings is to connect all this information we are able to connect this clinical decision support system, the communication, a communication hub for all the clinical team, and a protocol management system in just one place. And the idea is, is the same. We connect the data, uh, we build a 360 vision of the patient, and then we have different channels of showing this data. So the healthcare team can access the data from the patient by an app, can, can, uh, can, they can see the data from the patient in real time from web systems. And um, they have real-time insights of what's happening, what are the patients at risk, what are the alerts, uh, what, are, what the patients may have, and we provide these clinical insights as well. And we can connect to the microbiology as well, and we can uh, show to the healthcare team uh, what uh, patients um, have uh, resistance to antibiotics, what, what type of resistance this is, and everything is connected to, to microbiology in real time. Uh, this is a very important thing because um, in Brazil, it's very common that doctors usually spend six months to one year to collect the, um, the data from the pathogens and to see what's the clinical history of that hospital, of what are the, anti the, the antibiotics that are resistant or not resistant to specific types of pathogens. And with Laura, the clinicians can do it in seconds because they have the data on their hands. So that's the power of connecting the data and making uh, and providing artificial intelligence algorithms. As I told you, we are on one of the main health techs in Brazil. We were recognized as one of the, 10, the top 10 health techs in Brazil um, for our team, because of our team, because of our impact and um, because of uh, the customers we have. And this is a very important slide. These slides will show our results. We have more than 8 million medical records that were analyzed. We have done a study analyzing what, what was the impact of LoRa after the implementation in the hospitals. And we got a reduction of 25% in the general mortality um, and a decrease in the patient length of stay of 10%. We have monitored uh, with LoraCare more than 300,000 people in Brazil. And um, we are in more than 50 healthcare centers, uh, healthcare payers, providers, and the pharma industry as well. This is a study, uh, actually this award that we got from Hims of CVA as uh, a digital innovation uh, award in healthcare, because we got a savings, savings of $1 million in one hostel by the use uh, of LoRa, as they had the clinical decision support system, they could uh, reduce the patient length of stay and they could reduce their cost, their cost as well. And this, this was a award for the whole Latin America. We invest a lot on science as we are building machine learning algorithms that are related to healthcare. All our, our algorithms should be validated and they are validated. Uh, we have peer-reviewed peer papers about the, the applications of our machine learning algorithms. And um, Next month, it's going to uh, happen the SAIL event. SAIL is one of the main symposiums of artificial intelligence in healthcare. And they selected five papers worldwide um, applied to artificial intelligence in healthcare. And um, they, this is being organized by Harvard, by John Hopkins, by New England Journal of Medicine. And out of the six, five papers, Laura is one of them, is the only one in Latin America. So for us, it's a, it's a great pleasure. So I think from Laura, it's all. I'd like to thank you for your attention and for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, Christian, I'd like to ask a question. Thank you very much for the, the super presentation. You've analyzed over 11 million uh, records. How could you apply that quickly in expanding to say the UK? And, and what would you need from the UK to to allow you to do something similar? Well, we have the expertise from more than 40 hospitals in Brazil. Uh, the challenge that we face, it's very similar. 
because uh, in Brazil there's the challenge of interoperability, and here there's the ch the challenge of interoperability as well. So basically, what we would need it would be to integrate our technology here. We would have we would need to have access to the data, and uh, we would be able to build our machine learning algorithms. Of course, we would have to study the implementation and application of these machine learning algorithms because we are dealing with a different epidemiology. Uh, but within a few months, we could validate it, all the machine learning algorithms we have for the UK reality. No, that's excellent because in, in the UK, obviously, the integrated care systems are very important and we're looking to, to monitor the patient journey from all the different uh, sectors. And the 10% of the most complex cases make up 50% of the cost. So being able to predict these cases and uh, deterioration is very important. So I think there's a lot of potential for Laura. But thank you very much, uh, Christian. Thank you very much. Hi. Oh, hello. Can I sing a song? No. Sorry, I came late. Um, uh, thank you. That was really interesting. I caught the tail end of that. Um, everyone goes on and on about big, fat hospitals. Do you have any case studies in primary care? Yeah. So we started uh, in, hospitals, in hospital settings. And um, afterwards, uh, during the pandemic, the COVID pandemic, the hospitals started to ask us, "What? Uh, how could we? How could we help them? And how could you bring this technology that we developed for in-hospital settings for out-hospital settings?" Um, so we built a system for uh, that we call it a patient relationship management platform or digital remote monitoring that is able to triage what the patients are the highest risk based on the symptoms. And this can be done remotely. So we develop it and this is mostly used by healthcare payers for primary care, for GPs and um, for the nurses to identify what are the patients that are at risk, what patients should be monitored, what patients should not be monitored and everything can, can be done in the platform. And uh, they can select what patients have they can identify what patients have chronic conditions and uh, insert this patient in healthcare uh, monitoring pathways. Um, and they can also identify the epidemiology of uh, a population by this, by this technology. And LoraCare is mostly used in the primary care for patient digital remote monitoring. Yeah, that's where all the activity is. So do you have integration between primary and secondary care yeah we do because i think there are lots of bits of tech that does a bit of primary care and there's some that does secondary care but not many transcend those two places so that 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 is different actually so yeah that that that's the the thing we started in hospital settings and then that's the most complex uh, vision in the healthcare and then we went to the primary care and we have all the data connected. Uh, someone has one more question? No? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you again, Christian, for that great presentation. And of course, Dr. the legendary Dr. Tal Mahmoud, who is uh, the, pa the, the champion of primary care here. So in... Uh, one minute, we'll be introducing Thomas Oliver, founder and CEO of Omnos. He's actually here. Uh, so I just want to say that very, very great to see uh, Thomas here there because as we know, health is not about curing diseases only, but uh, keeping us healthier for longer. And uh, uh, Thomas is uh, esteemed author of Cracking uh, the, Your Health Code and also CEO, as I said, of Health Intelligence Platform for Longevity Omnos. So over to you, Thomas. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for being here. So I just want to introduce to you um, to Omnos, but first I want to ask you a question. Because as the CEO of Omnos and the founder, the vision that I have cannot really come to formation if the same problem we mentioned, we address one thing. 
And uh, so the question is, what is this one thing that we need to truly address uh, before cracking the code really of personalized health? So before ans answering all those questions, um, I want to talk about the driving, the driving force of change and what the last decades, let's say, how the industry has changed and actually uh, has really igniting a very interesting ecosystem that we can tap on now to potentially achieve that. The first thing is the ever-growing burden of chronic illness. So few numbers here, but 15 million represent the amount of people here um, in the UK having a chronic illness. It's estimated by 2023, 18 million of them uh, uh, will be having one uh, or, or several conditions. 47 trillion is actually by 2028 the estimation of what it will cost globally um, chronic illness and we're talking about you know big numbers that can put every country down to its knee which already we know healthcare system most healthcare system are in depth and finally 75 percent is just a number explaining that all of those main chronic illnesses are totally preventable by changing your lifestyle your diet and your environment even uh, up to 40% of the cancer are totally preventable. Now, what we understand though is the approach needs to change. And one thing that is very important is to understand that we now need to leave this sort of high down molecular aspect to look at one cause and effect of a disease, but more at looking at our bodies at a very complex mechanism need to understand those pathways within us and need to connect the dots and potentially look at preventing those pathways um, for longevity and to prevent those illnesses. So, and the good thing is we really try to shift that and actually we understand with the, the new pandemic as well uh, that we, we just had that mainly the people who are suffering the most do have metabolic issues that are caused by lifestyle uh, problem. So now there's this evergreen cultural awakening again because of this uh, pandemic uh, we now getting accustomed to uh, testing at home. Um, I probably had 20 tests in the last three months traveling a bit uh, you know and I'm hurting on my fingers and <laughs> uh, constant block sinuses so um, it has become very familiar but what about having tests that could analyze what's going on inside our bodies right now and trying to connect the dots on what we should do about it. And right now, 80%, more than 80%, 88% of the consumer in the US and UK and Germany are actually more likely to go towards those options. So this is what um, um, 487, this is what um, uh, a person will spend in average in the UK on wellness next year. So it's it's obviously this very fast growing trends and it started a long time ago. Um, you know, uh, we can go back to Arnold Schwarzenegger pumping iron and Jane Fonda video and all those things. Uh, being a president running is becoming, you know, a good thing to do. But right now it has completely changed in the sense that it's really a cultural thing to be healthy. I mean, and a lot of people go to the office in their yoga pants now, right? So it's all even trend. So we are now entering really the, the also the area of micro tracking um, in, in the sense that we have the evolution of devices and, and, and technologies that allow us to do all those things. So to track data, we have became a, a, a really uh, interesting um, cascade of data. Uh, this ring that I'm wearing, for example, tell me about my sleep, my body temperatures, all those different things. And, you know, I knew I probably had COVID back in January before testing because I had my HIV going down and my temperature raising. I knew this was probably COVID and I did the test, but I knew before. So that was very interesting uh, also. So we, we have access to all those technology now and they're becoming more widely available. But this is all promising. This is amazing, and we have the fundamentals for it all. But there's one big thing we ignore here, and it's the healthcare data management you just mentioned about, right? Um, and data is a massive growing commodities, and already back in 2017, it was uh, more valuable than oil. But 
uh, and you can see with the behavior of big companies acquiring data. Um, and if you look at Apple's healthcare with their smartwatch, they're, they're actually looking at over $300 billion of revenue just by health data. So it's really a fast growing community and it's a community that actually could also benefit us as individual. And this is what I would like you to, ex uh, to explore with you. But the problem is, and this is exactly what you mentioned, is the siloed and disconnected aspects of all those data. So we really need to look now, if, if, you, if you look at the history of you, you have a lot of health data, but they're all scattered everywhere, defragmented, and they don't have a narrative of what who you are and what it means for you right now in your context. But if you actually put all those data together, it could make, make a story and understand all those things. So you might have done a genetic test and it's on a company server somewhere uh, and you don't have access to all of those data. You have a few clues about them. You know that you are coming from Neanderthals or Marie Antoinette was your you know, family or something, but it, it's not that interesting. But when you look at all those health data, in relation to your predisposition to certain diseases, your historic or even the family history you have, but very good information to know what can be prevented for yourself. And then potentially inform you and educate you about how being proactive towards it. So the solution really, it's about really giving full data ownership and transparency to the individual because if you have a situation where you repeal that an institution or um, your doctor or you know repeal your access of your data, you can actually have this ownership where you're going to be back at the center of your health because you can have application around those data that will enable you to be more proactive and potentially be on the, on the prevention side. And what about maybe opting in and out of sharing those data if you wanted to with health professional and obviously having the healthcare ecosystem behind to uh, support you on your health journey. So this is what we, we do at Omnos is we're really about democratizing health and uh, it, it's a big thing, but you know, democratizing simply means that makes the complex simple and trying to make it accessible for everyone. But what it means at uh, in, I'm going to go there, uh, individual level is basically having an input and an output. And the input can be in this proactive healthcare system, if there's all those data available, um, what are your health goals? What are your lifestyle? Try and understand you, what you do in your daily life, your diet, your family history, potential symptoms you may have, and your genetic data. What are your predisposition to certain diseases or, or potentially, uh, you know, certain pathways or food interferences that can create inflammation, all these sort of things. Uh, blood markers, what's going on inside your body right now? Um, and how does it relate with all the other data, such as your environment, your lifestyle, your genetic data? Uh, if you're predisposed to high cholesterol uh, and you decide to be uh, uh, you know, a big carnivore, uh, but are sedentary, you're quite more likely to have issues with those cardiovascular diseases. Uh, performance tests, wearable data, any type of data. But the output of it is really personalized prevention and, and predictive analytic. Uh, and then all the things you can do by that, uh, by giving you personalized recommendation on potential supplements you may have uh, or you may need. Uh, obviously, supplement comes after food, but um, health empowerment. But more importantly is being you, I mean, you being back in charge of your own health. You now have a relationship with your own biology and you are in charge. So you're more engaged and potentially can be more proactive and makes changes. Then it's all about this decentralization, um, how to make it accessible. And we have amazing technology. We all have amazing computers in our pockets now, uh, and they make quick calculations. So we can really give you real-time information. And even for health experts, um, having access to all those data directly that you already have and you opt in to share those data with them, having the historic of your data, having certain markers, um, having 
understanding of condition you may have, autoimmune disease, all this sort of thing, can help them to make better decisions um, and also better informed decision for, for yourself or for, for the whole family. Then if we look at uh, institution like insurance is the same. Uh, you, you can have certain client data uh, if you were to wish again to share those data uh, and doing predictive analysis, uh, comparative metrics, uh, all those sort of things. Then you know, corporate environment is more about the performance of your company and how it can have an impact on your production. Uh, and, and yes, so all those different things can be uh, achieved. In the retail environment, understanding your preferences, your needs in terms of diet uh, can help you make the right choices and empower you to be um, doing personalized shopping, basically. So data ownership, really, um, it's all about, sorry if I'm scaring you with this big slide, but. Um, from now, it's all about this siloed and isolate, isolated data connection. But now we have amazing technology that we could implement and use to make secure data exchanges with the blockchain, for example. Uh, AI and machine learning, which you explained very well how it can be used to actually make quicker decision and informed decision based on big data sets. Um, the cloud where everything can be shared quickly and finally, real-time intervention with Internet of Things, where you can link hardware. And the output as well is, is about this collective learning. The more people use and upload data, the more we find out about what are the certain things to do or how patterns can be recognized and what it means and developing grants and doing research. So this is what it should be tomorrow. And how we got started with Omnos, um, it's very simple. Um, we, we do this ecosystem where we all start with a, a self-assessment, asking you a lot of questions about your lifestyle, your diet, your environment, uh, symptoms assessment. And then we already know what are the area, um, thanks, thanks to our algorithm, that you need to investigate. Once we have those data, um, which comes out of very complex medical test, but we are omnosifying it, which means that we're making it simple. Uh, and we make it this, make this data analysis and work in order of priority what within your context, within your lifestyle, your diet, or the symptoms you may have, what is your top priority and how you can address this before it becomes cr critical. If it's clinical already, we have experts that reach out to you rather than you trying to reach out to them. Um, and you can already, we, they will see already on their professional dashboard what the issues are. Um, and then it's all this education part of giving you things where we explain what it means, what, um, I don't know, carbohydrate rates, for example, what, what does it mean? Uh, those parasites in your, in your microbiome, what do they mean to you? And what are the symptoms related to them and why they are there and how you can then be on a journey to remove those parasites. Um, and this is the reason why, for example, you're lacking of iron uh, because they're iron feeding. So you're learning about all those things and it's engaging. And yeah, so the, the, the vision again is for us, um, because we are at this level where we have connecting the dots between all those uh, data and making narratives for everybody to understand what are their top priority when it comes to health prevention. The, the, the data privacy is obviously a very secure um, model, but we also want to give in this ownership data as an asset in the sense that your wealth, I mean, your health could be your wealth literally because those data are becoming a, a fast commodity and you can potentially trade those data for research for even if you want with your insurance company uh, because those data are very valuable. Instead of those data being siloed and being profitable to big corporation without you benefit, benefiting from it. So it's about enabling those data sharing for collective learning as well with the research. So right now, this is what we're developing and um, we have all those different tests available, but for at the individual level, it's already represent more than 600 uh, unique data points that tells us about 
how well you are, what are your potential risks um, in, in certain things and how you can perform. And what are the things you need to do to optimize your own health dashboard, I would say. So yeah, that was me. Thank you very much. Any question? Thank you, Kristen. That was a visionary, uh, excellent presentation and about holistic health and the use of data. I see this as being um, very valuable for, for certain people in, in the community that want to do this in quantified self and in, in the more higher economic uh, bands. Do you think you can do a, a Omnos light for the primary healthcare system for something like the NHS? Yes, we're actually sort of working on this um, in, in the sense that uh, there's a lot of medical data that can be uh, historical data that can be uploaded to the platform that already would have, uh, you know, uh, re recommendation and yeah, we can, it's also the, when things are clinical, um, we do test for prevention, um, but all those tests are medical, uh, diagnostic. If, you, if, we, if we look at, for example, uh, our microbiome test, look at a lot of different uh, markers, not just dysbiosis, which is, you know, the, the good and bad bacteria. It looks at occult blood and all those different things. So if things are, clinical we refer directly to the gps or the gp you know uh, uh intervene so we, we 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 now only we're only a year old but we are starting to develop as a relationship right yeah Thank you. that's good a any other questions Thank you. That was a really good presentation thank you you know there's so many people who are saying oh give patients their records and all that stuff well yeah. newsflash patients don't understand those records and I think this is a much nicer way of being able to share that data and um, support behavior change which yeah. is the biggest problem I, I just wonder have you got some information or data on because you first you don't want to overwhelm patients with mm -hmm. too much too many of these buttons like genomics and stuff so as as um, Tony said the light a light version would be a good place to start but have you got any data around the impact that it's had on changing the behavior of patients yes we we start to see that actually first is again it's about when we call this omnosifying thing uh, this is an internal term right but it means a few things first is about disalienating the language so when we talk about democratizing is disalienating the language trying to remove almost the dogma you will have in legal or medical uh, to trying to explain in layman's terms what that means for you okay uh, that's very important um, just to come back to your first point and, and the second point is about the, the, the states of um, clinically you know emergency you wouldn't do a, a brain surgery on the platform right so <laughs> what i mean by that is there's a whole system of education but also uh, an ecosystem with pro health professional to support you on your journey but what we can do here as well in the language is obviously when you call about genetic, we only report on the things that are not, uh, we don't do rare disease, for example, or we don't necessarily report on the BRCA genes or this sort of thing. And also because there's so much mis misinterpretation about it. But what we, we say is your genes are not your fate, but uh, knowing about your predisposition will empower you to make better decision, right? So it's all about the language around it and also the support system you create around on how to when it's more clinical on how to address this but it's better in a way that people when they start their own health journey and especially let's say a you know a, a genetic test what people usually the reaction they have is wow i'm sort of meeting my own biology here it's funny this is me i i, I can see myself in all this um and this is how i am wired and just this creating this relationship it, it's like a intimate relationship you create and then you cannot escape it so then you're you're on this journey already you're just more proactive right yeah i'm so sorry told you i bet you wish you'd not come now I, I, <laughs> so pick ca carry on with that light idea i think yes um i so, think you could you could have say a diabetic patient yeah. see, it's all about behavior isn't it so yes you get their hba1c so that goes in mm -hmm. then you use their data from their wearables about movement and stuff yeah. and 
support their behavior and then you yeah. do their hba one scene another yeah, know, exactly three, so three, six months later yeah it's and i think i think if you just have that aspect and leave it nothing else to confuse people but that's what we're doing really, with the prioritization really so that that's the whole omnos 2.0 part which is all about prioritization what we know now is your main options option ones is basically come at option one if it's uh, you we know from your genetic test you're predisposed to type type, type 2 diabetes we know from or just from your lifestyle uh, um, a questionnaire that you're very sanitary uh, overweight and you actually do a blood uh, our one of our blood marker on your hbc one is is you know out of range um, then we're going to start to get educating educating you receiving your you have your content video about a low glycemic index food all this sort of thing and even if it's already sort of clinical we would make sure you have something like a glucose monitor and educate you even further for maybe three months with a health practitioner uh, to this is the type of food you should avoid this is the one and look how it reacts in your own body and this is real-time intervention and if you do that you're really changing a behavior of someone and this is the prioritization that we are doing. It's it's very important to, to have this hierarchy. And this is the whole sort of algorithmic nightmare we had to deal with for two two years or more to avoid all those conflicts and 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 making sure things work in prioritization when you have thousands and thousands of data. It's quite a complex thing, but we've done that. Yeah. yeah. No, thank you, thank you. And uh, before you leave the stage, Thomas, I think that was a such a fantastic presentation because. I see many companies that talk about longevity and preventive health, but to engage so well with the primary care thing, I think is going to, because so many ignore the primary health doctor and try to circumvent and you're missing the biggest opportunity. But Dr. Tal Mahmood, you should take, take, that, take that name, one of the most innovative GP practices in London, but he definitely would be somebody to speak to because I think there's so much potential to, to bring the two together. Yeah. Obviously, you have the advanced version there, but something more streamlined for the public health practice is worth, worth a conversation. Yeah, definitely. But uh, thank you very much to Thomas. Thank you very thank much. You. So hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode, which is about digital therapeutics and introducing DTX Impact. Very happy to introduce you to Tony Kiprios. Hello, Tony. How are you today? Very well. Thank you, Barry. Excellent. Glad you could join us. Thank you. So. We'd like to take a step back. We have this word DTX, digital therapeutics, which we hear a lot, but I think it's not necessarily um, a, a well understood or well defined concept or, or, or phrase. So let's take a step back, please, Tony. And if you could tell us from an um, from expert perspective, what is DTX? Thank you, Barry. Um, well, it's, it's in a way been happening for a long time, but now it's become much more formalized. It started off as telehealth and uh, digital health, etc. But now it's digital therapeutics is probably best defined by the great work of the Digital Therapeutics Alliance. And it's mm. to paraphrase it in, in three ways. It's to prevent, manage or treat a disorder or disease. Secondly, it's a medical interve intervention driven by software. And thirdly, it can actually be independent or complementary to drugs. So they're the three main foundations to, to DTX. Right. Well, um, if you could help us, Shafi, to understand a little bit, please, about your background and okay, yeah. uh, committees and so forth that you're involved in. So, yes. So I'm, of course, Shafi Ahmed. I'm a surgeon based in London, working at the Royal London Hospital. And I've been a cancer surgeon for the past 30 years. Over the last decade or so, I've moved more into med tech and innovation uh, and work with colleagues, of course, here on this call together. I think in terms of the government policy and driving change, I've been involved in what's called the Cancer Five-Year Forward View. Uh, which was run about three or four years ago, we looked at the whole cancer service across the UK and how that should be changing to become more digitalised and more relevant to today's society. I also sit on the NHS Assembly, which is uh, 50 members from different disciplines across the NHS are working on how to implement the NHS long-term plan for 2030. And that's chaired by the Chief Executive of the NHS at the moment, which is Amanda Pritchard. I've also worked with uh, corporate companies like Vodafone, looking at how policy in 5G, for example, could help governments understand the capabilities of connected health. The last thing I've been involved with governments across the world, including Abu Dhabi, working with the Ministry of Health, to understand how they could transform their society and healthcare using digital enable systems and bring entrepreneurship into the region. 
Okay, so we also have Tony Kiprios. Hello, Tony. Good to see you. Hi, Barry. Nice to be here. So to begin with, Tony, if you could just share with the audience a little bit about your background. Yeah, sure. My, my background has been in uh, corporate innovation within uh, telecoms and consumer goods and in um, media. And during my time in telecoms, we were sort of early pioneers within uh, mobile health, as it was called back then. Mm. I've also been involved in corporate venture capital. Um, so as an investor, so very much involved in the, in the venture capital journey that many of these companies have to go through. And finally, probably the most relevant and the most painful often is, is I've been an entrepreneur several times over myself, most recently with my own telehealth company, which uh, we exited in 2017. So that, that's my sort of um, three dimensions of looking at the problem. Yes, yes. No, that's excellent. Thank you. And good to hear about your impressive career and accomplishments. Hi, uh, my name's Tal. I'm a GP. Uh, I have been a clinician for 20 years. Well, I've been a GP for 20 years. And I've had a variety of roles, which include um, working on the board of uh, uh, um, CCG, the Professional Executive Committee, and also uh, a chair of um, uh, our GP Federation. I've also you know, got an interest in digital health and have done recently done um, an MBA at London Business School. And I run a large GP practice in West London where we try lots of innovative ideas and have an interest in research. Incredibly interesting conversation so far. And uh, these themes of digital therapeutics and software as a medical device are uh, important for healthcare and for addressing some of the biggest challenges in healthcare. So Shafi, we'd like to continue the, the discussion and um, we'd like to explore what are some of the challenges in digital therapeutics? If you're a DTX company, what's an example of some of the challenges? So there's a number of challenges, Barry, I think the companies face. One is around real world validation. So for example, adding uh, the treatment, it could be an app or other kind of therapy, uh, and may or may not be in conjunction with, of course, a pharmacological agent, but showing the efficacy around patient utilization or improving outcomes or improving access to medicines, wherever it is. That's really hard to do sometimes, to access real patients in the real world. And of course, the data that they present with, uh, how valid is that compared to other measures that we might uh, have for the same um, treatment uh, regimens, for example. So that's yes. one thing. The other thing is about sharing data keeping data, understanding what that means uh, as you go forward. And that's the issues around uh, confidentiality, the ethics, the governments around uh, the capture of patient data and showing that on a wider scale. And the last thing that we forget about is that user experience and user interface. We often use that in computing kind of uh, language. But actually, is that relevant for people in that community or in the hospital setting to be used? And what does that look like in terms of access to those kind of uh, therapies. The last thing is regulatory affairs, of course, trying to get into a system, answer the regulations of different continents, different jurisdictions, in terms of how they overcome some of the barriers so that their framework is used. The last thing is remuneration. How do you use that? How do you remunerate? How do you make the, uh, the case for uh, accessing money that will then drive sales or um, allow people to use that with resources available to it from a healthcare system. So those are a few of the kind of uh, immediate things I think about. Sure. Excellent. Thank you, Tal. Um, we also want to talk about some of the challenges if you are a DTX business. So uh, let's look at that, please, briefly. So, um, Tony, uh, what are some challenges for DTX companies? Oh, you're on mute, Tony. I'd like to build on some of the uh, comments that Tal actually made, which is very, very, very profound, actually. And the, one of the key things is the difference to pharma in that, um, you know, the actual cost to market for a pharmaceutical drug and molecular uh, or biological or vaccine is a, a billion dollars. The cost to market of a digital therapeutic could be five to ten million dollars. So the actual cost of getting there is much less. Secondly, time to market, as, as Tal said, um, you know, you have a 20 year pattern, but it could take you 10 to 12 years to actually get to market. Whereas yes. time to market is much faster for a digital therapeutic. It's, it's a digital speed of two to four years. 
And that's very different from how pharmaceutical companies behave and manage and operate. And that I come from it from very much the consumer behavior that Tao mentioned, and also the digital and mobile design. And the design with digital therapeutic is very iterative with rapid feedback loops, which you can't do with drug discovery. So the actual methodology and approach and culture of a digital therapeutics company is very different to a pharmaceutical company. Although now there are s several similarities or, or, or elements. There's regulatory approval, there's clinical validation, and typically a prescription is required, and that's the way we're going. So um, on the ac active agent, so with depression, you know, serotonin reuptake inhibitors is the active agent, uh, whereas in a digital therapeutic for depression, the active agent is actually user engagement to, to, go, to comply perhaps with cognitive behavioral therapy. So there's, there's many differences, but also increasingly loss of compliance and regulatory um, dimensions that, that create some of these challenges. So before it's a digital health company, a wellness company, you didn't have any of these challenges. You go to market, but then again, there wasn't really the efficacy. There wasn't the, the discipline, the rigor. And so one of the key challenges we found in talking to many of these digital therapeutics companies is the actual quality of team and cross-functional capabilities you need to have. You yes. Know, mobile design, data science, regulatory compliance, content creation, clinical trial design, working with pharmaceuticals, and also a lot of the compliance around quality management systems, information security, risk management. So the actual demands on small companies is much greater than it has been before. And that's one of the first sure. challenges to create that, that really effective organization that we're finding. Hmm. Very good, thank you for that. We would also like to explore, let's say for example, we have a company from overseas. We have a Californian software business. They're getting off the ground in digital therapeutics. What would, how would they overcome some of the challenges that you've just mentioned? Let's say for example, they'd like to enter the UK market. Uh, what are some opportunities for them or how would they, how would they begin to address that? So I think the first thing to say is the UK market is becoming more mature over the last 18 months, we've seen a, a complete change of uh, thinking due to the pandemic, allowing great acceleration of introducing new ideas, new technologies, or indeed new therapies to help patients uh, in the UK. That's the first thing. So the mindset has shifted. Secondly, we have a number of organizations uh, or stakeholders across the NHS, for example, who are now really encouraging innovation. That's NHS X or NHS Digital or the uh, Academic Health Science Network we're now understanding how to bring an idea to market, to support companies from outside. Hmm. And the other thing that's also changing is the kind of understanding of how we overcome the barriers to adoption, okay? And I'm sure, sure. we we'll discussed that more about clinical trials and how we bring uh, therapists in and do the necessary validation across those lines, supporting those companies. And of course, there's many other uh, areas that we'll discuss over the next uh, few minutes, of course. Dr. Tal Mahmood, who can talk, talk about this from the perspective of a clinician. So we're talking about what DTX is, Tal, and we're talking about um, examples of companies uh, in digital therapeutics. So uh, if you could give us some thoughts there, please. Yeah, I, I think um, uh, there are lots of, the traditional way of treating people has, has changed. So traditionally pharmaceutical companies would go through a, a huge research and development program, produce, have clinical trials with, with drugs that you take orally and, and uh, have a patent which lasts for 20 years. And all of that has changed actually. There's been quite a few changes in the treatment options available. There's um, uh, increasingly um, a biotechnology which produces kind of changes to the, to the molecular structure of DNA the, the, and digital therapeutics is another arm of the treatment options that are available. So, for example, if you look at um, um, some drugs, such as um, drugs to do with uh, depression, for example, serotonin or citalopram, 60% of the uh, effectiveness of the drug is due to a placebo, which means that the effects can't be explained. The, the effect, taking the tablet results in improvement in 60% of people, even when they're not taking the actual pill itself, even if they're taking a sugar pill. Uh, 
Yes. So you kind of think, well, okay, well, perhaps there's a behavioral element to uh, the the clinical outcomes that we see. And and actually, digital therapeutics is, is one of the ways in which you can um, look to support a bit modifying behavior. And, and as Tony mentioned, um, it can be used alone or with medication to improve things like compliance or um, but but the, the main thing is to for it to result in improved clinical outcomes and and there's um, and to change behavior is really quite difficult so it's, it's it helps to nudge people along to perhaps modify their behavior I think it's um, Digital therapeutics has started relatively recently. However, it has been a fair amount of traction and there's increasing amount of evidence to suggest that it is likely to have a significant improvement of either the normal medications or or taking um, it or having it by itself. Yes. I suspect it will be here to stay. Hmm. Hmm. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. Would it also be uh, correct to say that um, the, 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 the fundamental approach to being able to provide some type of treatment or um, uh, enabling tool to a patient, which is software and digitally based, uh, is of course so profoundly different from the history of treatments based on drugs that there are bigger challenges relating to um, enabling the DTX provider to engage with the, um, the, the clinician who's prescribing. Um, and I, I think there's an issue which uh, uh, also uh, has to be considered there. In other words, clinicians' willingness to prescribe, their understanding of it, therefore the broader challenges for DTX businesses to understand what, um, h- how these things occur in the first place, especially if their background is not um, coming directly from the pharma industry. Yeah, Barry, I think that's a, that's a very good point. So Germany, for example, with Digger, is one of the leaders in the field. But even there, with all this work they've done, the, the actual awareness within the physicians and um, psychiatrists' professions, for example, is, is less yes. than 4%. So you've got 96% that aren't even aware of this. And of the 4%, there is the uh, trust and support issue in terms of how am I going to you know, what does this really do what it what it says it does? It's very different to my training or this this sort of area. So just because you're uh, prescribed doesn't mean your work is done. I think it's where your work begins. Mm, mm. That's a good point. Yeah. Thank you, Tony. So tell from your perspective. Uh... It, it, it is it is really interesting. Those the comments that both of you have just made around lack of adoption um from clinicians and and so i think there is this kind of challenge for digital therapeutics firms to um kind of to speak the language of pharmaceutical organized companies and also clinicians and then basically it comes down to something around harm so with drugs there is you know if something doesn't go quite right then there's potential of very serious harm and and that's you know not a good place to be with digital therapies there's lower risk of that it may not be effective that might be the issue but there's lower risk associated with digital therapeutics which then moves you on to well okay what about the benefits and i think for the benefits it's really difficult to for digital therapeutic firms to be able to quantify that number something may feel right something may feel you know that is the right sort of thing it kind of it should work it makes you feel happy a good example is gardening um so if you look at gardening and the improvement of physical and mental health there are there is an awful lot of evidence to suggest that that this has um that that this can improve your physical and mental well-being yep and yet it's not something that is um you know you don't generally go to clinician and and have uh, be prescribed a course on gardening there isn't you know a a digital therapeutics tool which suggests you know prompts you to go along and and garden yes um but but actually 
where I think the the where the answer lies with adoption of digital therapeutics is really around being able to get high grade evidence to suggest the effectiveness of an intervention and and that's i think the key of um patients using it or and and in in particular clinicians using yeah absolutely recommending it um yeah so going back to so we're talking about DTX, digital therapeutics, uh, uh, how it came to be, some of the challenges for DTX businesses. Tony, what are the challenges? Let's say, for example, you're a business overseas and you have an established DTX product or service and that's working in another country and you want to, to, you want to enter the UK market. What are some of those challenges? And uh, we're also, of course, introducing DTX Impact as an organization. So we'd love to learn as well about the connections there. Yeah, thank you, Barry. Um, say, for example, I mean, we, we talk to many companies from USA, Canada, Europe, and, and beyond, and um, they may have had a clinical validation and university research at, say, Grenoble University in France, and they've, they've proven uh, and got data from that, from that university. They've done the initial clinical trials and got data. Um, and efficacy. Now, that some of that is very valuable and very valid, but to actually come into the NHS system, you have to now do get some local data, get some uh, some of the actual um, information and clinical trials with a with a UK hospital or with a GP practice right. or whatever. So, it's a whole new method of of engagement. You probably would not have the credibility in terms of the medical profession to know where to make the connections. And we mm. say we see many scale-up ventures that have made success in other countries that really fall over in terms of finding the key opinion leaders, doing the clinical design, and just massive delays, six, 12 months when nothing comes out. So one of the key things we like to do is remove that friction and know the operational methods, know the key opinion leaders already, know the hospitals and GP practices that can do rapid pilots moving on to clinical trial design. So getting the data and the proof points and the credibility in the UK is very important and knowing the different routes there's many different routes it, it, the, the the uk market is a little bit uh less prescriptive than say germany okay uh, where you have many more ways of uh, of of getting into the the right place with the C's, the ccgs or the hsns etc so finding the right route for the right uh product and service with the right people is always a matching exercise and that comes from having very high quality well-connected physicians um and doctors in in the team. So that's very important that we found. Yes. Yes, excellent. We have um, heard a lot from the audience that, uh, of course, uh, a typical misconception from people from overseas is that in the UK, you have a single payer system and uh, a single provider of health, which is this thing referred to as the NHS. And uh, of course, it's an ongoing, I think, um, uh, challenge to help people from overseas learn uh, about the complexity uh, of the healthcare system in the UK. And for all intents and purposes, I guess one could say that there is no such thing as the NHS. There isn't a phone number that you would dial to say, hello, I'd like to enter the UK market. Can I speak to the buyer, please? So, um, for example, regarding hospitals, maybe it's a little more obvious. You find a hospital group, maybe you talk to them. But what about primary care? So tell for a foreign business um, who is doing something in DTX and is looking for perhaps uh, doing um, proper uh, uh, evidence studies and clinical trials uh, in primary care. Uh, does, uh, does DTX Impact ha- have an opportunity or a service to provide uh, in the world of primary care and an ability to help uh, customers understand that? Absolutely. Um, I, no, I'm, my shout out to the world is come along to the UK um, because this is the I think it's the perfect environment for um, uh, for, for, for organizations to um, uh, to 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 come because the, the, the we, there's a lot of pressure already the system needs some help and support and we need to explore innovative ways in which we can um, cope with the demand i think you know for example this winter i suspect will be will be difficult yes um but the also the the infrastructure around is supportive 
there's, I've seen I've seen the change in the last few years where there's a, a bigger push towards uh, supporting digital ideas. Uh, personally, I think I think I don't really like that word digital. I think it's not about the. It, it's it's we need to really understand what the problem is rather than thinking about it being a digital solution. But there are plenty, plenty of issues that I think we need some help with, and if people have ideas which idea you know which have worked abroad have had some traction and um you know the uk is a great place to be i, I think i think that the traditionally the model of um um healthcare is dominated by hospitals if you look around globally primary care often doesn't feature very much or if it does then it's not necessarily in a kind of meaningful way I think in the, the UK is a little bit different in that respect. Uh, um, um, here and in Singapore as well, the, the Cuba have a stronger primary care focus. And, and actually that lends itself to um, provision of, I, I'm a bit biased because I'm a primary care physician, but sure. it, it cost effective healthcare. Um, so I, th I think I think increasingly the, well, in in, the NHS is being organised, structurally reorganised into um, coordinated units where primary care, secondary care, mental health services, social services all come together and, okay. and commission services together. That's sort of work in progress at the moment, but, but, but primary care is a key element of, of that. Um, you know, we know our patients very well. We, we, uh, you know, I've watched patients grow old with me. You know, I've been in the same place for for a long time. They knew me when my hair wasn't as grey, and and <laughs> I've, I've watched I've watched patients grow up, get married, and looked after their children. So th there is a long term relationship there, which um, hospitals perhaps don't necessarily have. Yes, and, and it's it allows us to support proactive. Uh, care and wellness whereas hospitals you often go there if you have a specific condition exactly um, yeah so, so i i think primary care is well organized the uk is a great place to be it is very supportive of technology and there's there's funding and organizations whose main reason for existence such as nhsx is is to support digital innovation and also there's a really strong primary care in the uk which i i think lends itself to uh, getting the evidence for digital therapeutic uh, organizations. Yes. So, yeah. Very good. Thank you very much. That's been a really informative and insightful view of primary care in the UK. Tony, what's your view on that? I couldn't, I couldn't reinforce Tao more. Um, you know, secondary care is very much an intervention when somebody has a, a progressive disease state, but primary care is that long-term journey. And, um, it's particularly important for prevent prevention. And one of the key initiatives within NHS and major investment areas is the integrated care system, is social care, mental care, hospitals, yes. uh, GPs, et cetera. And that continuous feedback loop and adherence of a digital therapeutic over time can offload off of the, the hospital care system into the home environment. And when you do have to go back to hospital, you have that record, you have, you have an understanding of, the data that person has been going through, uh, dosage, um, personalization, all this sort of stuff. So right. I think the integrated care system movement within HS is going to be a massive opportunity for many digital therapeutics companies. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you, Tony. A really good additional observation there. Thank you for sharing. So we also uh, were talking about uh, DTX and uh, what DTX is. What are examples, Tony, of some of the leading players uh, in the digital therapeutics ecosystem? Uh, if you could give us some examples of businesses, what are they doing? Yeah, sure. I mean, we've been, as you know, Barry, and, and with Giant, we've been talking to many of these companies and many of them have been to the conference and spoken. So um, the ones that are real pioneers and we've been speaking to are, for example, Happyfy in, mm. in mental health. They're probably the world leaders in engagement and activation from their a gaming background and applying it in terms of behavioral change. Another one I really um, I'm impressed with is Achille from Germany in the area of ADHD for children using gaming there as well. Um, in America, uh, Pair Therapeutics is ex 
extremely extensive as, as a platform, particularly uh, start off with substance abuse, but they're in many other areas. Mm. Um, from the UK, Big Health has been uh, incredibly successful in insomnia and raised a lot of money and now is um, prescribed with the NHS. Um, nice. There's a company called Cognito that's a spin out of MIT for Alzheimer's, which is has FDA breakthrough designation. And we've talked a lot about behavioral change and CBT in the mobile phone, but they use advances in um, neuroimaging to be able oh. to look at audio and, and light strobing and uh, interventions to actually break through the blood brain barrier rather than through a, a, a molecular bloodstream. So watch this space because it's really moving on from purely CBT and mobile into some very novel uh, interventions. So, um, and the other thing of course is as Tal has mentioned before, you get that feedback. The pharmaceutical companies, if it's complementary to, to pharma, they can see side effects, they can see compliance, they can see adherence, they can personalize. And all of these successful players are, are really getting that data play correct. Tony, thank you. That's a very good point. And I'll certainly agree with you and good additional insights on top of Tal's descriptions of uh, primary care in the UK. So once again, thank you to Shafi, thank you to Tal, thank you to Tony. This has been a presentation from the team leading the DTX Impact business, which is helping foreign companies to enter the UK market. If you're working in DTX overseas or in diagnostics overseas, we have identified uh, a business and enormous opportunities to do business here in the UK. So uh, once again, thank you to Tal, thanks Tony, and thank you Shafi. Good afternoon again, everybody, here and in, uh, internationally. I'd like to introduce uh, now something very important because one of the things I, I mentor a lot of startups in digital health, and one of the key areas that they fail on is building great, interactive, resilient, and scalable digital products. So I'd like to introduce Balint of Bene, who's going to teach us all about how to build great digital uh, products for the healthcare market. Over to you, Balint. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, and uh, and uh, I'm Balin Bene, founder and CEO of uh, Bene Studio. And uh, today, uh, within this uh, this half an hour uh, discussion, I would like to to have a, a real discussion with you uh, and to support it. I know it's uh, quite end of uh, the day, and uh, uh, you must be tired. So I brought some chocolates, uh, <laughs> and uh, and. Uh, uh, Mm, I brought it to that people who ask questions because uh, I would like to to share uh, my experiences uh, answering your questions relating how to scale uh, a digital product uh, and to and to kick off it let me just uh, just highlight three things about myself so uh, I I always uh, organized things when I was five year old I organized a uh, uh, Mm, police from kids around the uh, the block. So it was my first uh, first business, first venture. And uh, a bit later, I founded two startups. And uh, after that, I worked at uh, enterprises. Um, so based on these diverse uh, experiences, I realized that the best way how I can help uh, others, I can help the ecosystem. Uh, is with the digital product consulting. So this is how Bene Studio started. Uh, and um, at the beginning, we worked in diverse industries, but but uh, I had a personal situation. My my grandfather, he died after a faulty uh, hospital treatment. And at that point, I realized that uh, there are so many things to improve and uh, and uh, and I I wanted to be part of this of this improvement to help other families, others uh, to avoid uh, similar um, similar problems. Um, so so it was it was the point when I realized that uh, health technology is not just uh, one industry for Bene Studio, but uh, it should be the the focus industry. It should be the uh, the specialty of Bene Studio. And a few words about Bene Studio. So uh, at Bene Studio, uh, we design and develop mobile and web applications for different health tech companies, for startups, for scale ups, and for enterprises as well. And it's a team of uh, more than 30 people. Uh, we are present in the US, UK, and we have a delivery office in Budapest. 
Uh, and we are active organizers of the ecosystem as well. We are organizing the Haltech Networking Club with more than 200 uh, participants, mainly providers, investors, specialists of the health tech uh, field. And today I want to share with you our more than 100 project experiences, which we gained during the previous 10 years. So uh, this is the, the moment when, when I will want to show you an example. And I hope that uh, through an example, uh, uh, we can see um, a case. And, uh, and based on that, you can have different questions, which I, I would be really happy to answer. Uh, so in this case, uh, Dynamic Air Health is our client. And uh, they are an addiction care digital startup. And they already operated on the market uh, when, when they uh, uh, faced an issue. Um, they had only one engineer for uh, mobile development, and that engineer left the company. Uh, on the other hand, um, there were um, a need and the pressure for, for uh, develop and, and grow fast. So uh, they started a cooperation with, uh, with Bene Studio. And uh, we provided, on one hand, uh, capacity for them so, so so now they can develop faster and they don't have to worry about uh, leaving clients people management and other issues uh, within the the technology team and we also have them uh, with other expertise which they uh, didn't have in-house like uh, user experience design or or other uh, uh, specialties like 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 architect uh, so the solution was setting up a team of experts uh, and uh, starting a continuous cooperation. Um, and uh, within this within this squad, um, we have a project manager, a product designer, a mobile engineer, backend engineer, security officer, and software architect as well. And um, part of the team is just uh, part dedicated, and other part is uh, is working more on the application. So this setup uh, provides a, a really a calculable and scalable uh, a solution for, for Dynamicare. Uh, and let me talk a bit about the project management because this is key in startups. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, project management is, is like 90% of the uh, uh, reason for failures. So usually the experts are good in what they are doing, good engineers, good designers, uh, but uh, um, with, the, with the wrong project management, um, we can face uh, with, uh, with uh, disastrous situations. So this is why project management is a key. Uh, and in many times we underestimate the importance of, of project manager uh, because uh, what, we, what we see is the, the end result uh, like a design which is more tangible or a code which is working. But uh, behind that, if, if the project management is, is not, not, ad not adequate, then, um, then the result won't be the desired result. Um, so in this case, when we worked with uh, Dynamic Care, uh, we, we organized uh, our new developments in sprints. So we are working in two week sprints and uh, we fix the upcoming sprint. So uh, it provides a stability for the team. So what's defined for the next two weeks, it's there and uh, nobody touches it. Uh, but we also provide the flexibility to the startup because uh, you may know it even better that in a startup, everything is changing all the time. So the requirements are also changing. Uh, and, uh, and over the two weeks for the upcoming uh, sprints, we have we have uh, a roadmap and uh, and we have a huge flexibility for that uh, what developments to put into the upcoming sprints so this way uh, we can combine uh, the effective delivery on short time and uh, and the flexibility for for midterm uh, and another important thing for founders or business side uh, managers product managers is their control and to have a transparency, what's happening uh, under the hood when, when an, an extended team is working on the product. So for that, in, in this case, uh, we have regular meetings um, for the plannings, for the alignment, 
and uh, and we use an asynchronous chat uh, for the for the ad hoc communication. We also track the tasks in Jira, uh, so the 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 client side product manager can see uh, what is the progress. Uh, so we provide the transparency as well, and therefore we provide the control as well to the client. But they don't have to micromanage. Uh, they just tell their priorities in a high level to our project manager, and the project manager mm, takes care of all the other details, uh, break down the tasks, schedule the, the, the time of the different experts, uh, deal with the, with the people issues. And um, we also can, can solve not just the basic uh, HIPAA and uh, GDPR compliance, but, uh, but special uh, third-party risk assessment requirements as well, which, uh, which is needed in case of, of Dynamicer. So in Hashtag, it's an, it's, uh, it's an important aspect. And now I would like to give you the opportunity to, to, to ask your uh, first questions. I'll ask something, uh, Valent. I think it's really good that you uh, mentioned project management as key to managing these things. What do you find is the difference between some startups going and saying, I'm going to build my own team, have my own architect and developer versus in the earlier stages working with somebody like you? What's the pros and cons? Mm -hmm. Yes, thanks. It's a really good question. And, and there is no good or bad uh, um, solution. So it depends on the actual uh, status and actual phase of that company. Uh, we have uh, clients where, uh, where the majority of the uh, design and development is uh, delegated to Benet Studio. So the, the, the core team can focus on the, on the product uh, concept, on the sales, on the marketing and the healthcare core business. Uh, it's, uh, it's one model which, uh, which can work better uh, uh, if the communication is uh, seamless between the between the uh, the stakeholders, so in this case, uh, the key is uh, is having a strong project management on the on the extended team side, and uh, and having a, a strong product management on the client side. So if that two people can discuss with each other regularly, uh, then the directions will be aligned and uh, and the cooperation uh, uh, is seamless. So the, the benefit of this model is that uh, if uh, the startup is quite small, they can focus their internal energies on their uh, unique uh, uh, aspects and they can delegate uh, a big portion of the work uh, to a partner like Banet Studio. Uh, and they don't have to split their focus, their budget. Um, it's one model. Another model can be when when everything is is designed and developed in house, and when when it's a it's a it's a mission for the for the company doing this way, um, and it it also can work. Uh, I see good examples when, for example, the founders are coming from the engineering field; uh, their their strengths are are in the technology, so they can naturally uh, um, prioritize the the techy things over the business things or the healthcare things. In that case, they have to deal with, uh, with that aspect somehow, but, uh, but uh, mm, the, the product itself can, can, be, uh, can be in good hands in that cases. But what I, I also see is, uh, is when such a, a tech-funded company uh, starting to grow, like they are, uh, they are in Series e, A and, uh, and they have to to, to scale up the, the product in a huge tempo, then they usually uh, um, make a decision to, to, uh, to uh, match this, uh, this in-house uh, focus with a, with a healthy balance of, uh, of outsourcing to, to an external uh, extended team. Uh, just because um, building up a team internally takes one, two years, and they just can't afford that time. And at that point, they, they have more money and they have more pressure from the, uh, from the investors and from the market uh, than, uh, than, than what they can win with, uh, with just uh, keeping everything in-house. Um, another thing can be uh, um, 
um, setting up the, the priorities. So in, in every business, uh, we, we can have uh, core elements, which are the unique, uh, uh, unique propositions of that business. And, and we should have a lot of other elements which are mandatory but but not uh, not a unique element so uh, usually it's a healthy setup when a, when the really core uh, healthcare algorithm is in house but uh, but the application itself is provided by an extended team so the company can focus on the on the very core solution and uh, and can uh, balance it with a, with an external partner thank you thank you any other questions design related question how important is it that there's a really established brand before coming on to doing the uh, the interface for the software is it is it a two-way conversation is it something that you expect to you know the look and feel and the voice and all of that to be integrated in that or is that something that comes back the other way from from your own sort of development that feeds back into the branding of the Mm -hmm. um, so, so your, your your question is related to uh, how to balance the, the the sales marketing branding of a, of a, a product and the and the actual development of the yeah. solution. How, how, how mm -hmm. integrated are they? Mm -hmm. Wow, it's a it's a really good question. And uh, before answering it, let me deliver your chocolate. <laughs> thanks for thanks for the great question. <clears throat> uh, yes, yeah, so so. Um, Based on uh, our experiences working with uh, with early stage startups uh, who just have the idea, and working with scale up uh, companies who have uh, a bigger staffs and uh, and bigger track record, uh, what we can see that uh, that the sales marketing branding uh, and the product development uh, is uh, is going hand in hand. Um, so, um, I I. Uh, so a few companies uh, where where one aspect was uh, was too so, too strong, too much in the focus, and uh, and it's 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 never uh, never that good. So, for example, there are companies which are founded by uh, by professionals or techie people, doctors, and uh, sometimes they they really really focus on the on the solution itself so they build it for for like several years without showing it to anyone without uh, really getting it out uh, to the market and um, we uh, Bene studio at the beginning also uh, were involved in such developments and uh, and we made mistakes so even myself at that time made uh, mistakes because uh, I didn't challenge that aspect uh, back then. Uh, I just uh, tried to help uh, developing what they asked for. And, uh, and I just uh, accepted that they don't want to, to deliver it to the market, to test it uh, with real users, uh, collecting real feedbacks. But after a year of development, we realized that the, uh, the product is uh, is not matching with the with the demand from the uh, from the market so i learned that time that uh, even if the client is asking for for uh, uh, just development uh, uh, hiding uh, the solution and uh, and just doing it uh, uh, in the darkness we we now always uh, make a pressure on them to 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 uh, release it to the users, at least a uh, smaller group of uh, test users, uh, and to bring feedbacks back into the development. This is why uh, this, this uh, two-week sprint is really useful, um, because uh, if an, an experience is coming back from the field, then we can put that change on the roadmap uh, like um, two months from now. So, so this way, uh, the roadmap is a is a healthy, healthy organization, uh, and we always can can update it based on the feedbacks. So, so this is the experience with uh, with too um, too, uh, too much uh, uh, planning and and, uh, and secret around the, the the product, and too much focus on the building and uh, and less on the market. But sometimes we can see the the other side as well. 
uh, when the when the, the the sales is the driver, uh, which is good in general, uh, I believe. Uh, but sometimes when when there is a, um, an ad hoc uh, need from from a um, um, client, and uh, and if the product uh, is too flexible, like uh, if they just hear about a, re a feature request, they implement it uh, instantly in the application. Uh, and next week they they uh, hear an other kind of request, which is the complete opposite of the previous weeks. Uh, then they they want to implement that other change. Uh, it causes problems with the product because uh, because on a midterm or a long term uh, it will be a messy uh, product. So it will be no focus, no real solution for a, for an adequate uh, audience. Just a bunch of different features which are changing all the time it's not good for the business first of all but it's also not good for the technology so uh, it's harder to maintain a system which uh, which is lack of uh, consistency so this is why um, our experience is the the the, the better is is somewhere in the middle so so being a bit uh, bit strict with the uh, clients and with the feedbacks and and not to implement everything on the spot just keep a, uh, a bit of, uh, of of time um for that but on the other hand uh, being open uh, to the audience and uh, and releases uh um so so release the solutions uh, frequently so i i guess um, it can be a good balance between the sales marketing and the changes and the and the and the product development itself and thanks for the great question <laughs> let me give you this fa fantastic chocolate yeah who is asking for the next chocolate <laughs> can i have some chocolate <laughs> Uh, hi. So you talked about um, providing solutions to different clients, and uh, I was just going through your website as well. So um, it's from different fields. Clients come to you for different solutions and different software and these type of stuff. So you talked about sales and marketing as well. And my question is, like, how do you balance between your expertise and client demand? Because oh. the thing is, like, if you if the client comes up with some sort of a demand for you and you don't agree with that or you have some different thing in mind so there's a clash of interest as well between your client and you so how do you deal with that and what's the percentage of your expertise and your input versus clients demand yeah thanks it's a it's a really good question and uh, and a really challenging situation at the same time uh, so what I prepared with, uh, which is connecting to this this question, is uh, I collected a few tips if uh, if we want to fail, how to do it properly, <clears throat> because we talk a lot a lot about uh, how to be successful and so on. We have a lot of materials on the internet how to be successful, but uh, but less uh, how to fail. So if we want to fail properly, uh, then I I collected a few uh, few experiences, most of them from my past so i failed a lot uh, during the different projects smaller and bigger failures uh and uh, and if we discover it we can we can realize okay how how can we maybe avoid that that failures if we if we don't want uh to fail that much <clears throat> yeah so so um so um, in that situation, uh, when when we have demand uh, from the client and and we have our own expertise, it's 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 always a kind of internal and external fight to find the 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 good balance. Uh, but my experience is that uh, if one size one side is is too too uh, strong, like uh, like everything is is just done how the uh, client defined um, or everything is done without any communication with the client um, both are a really good solution for uh, for a failure uh, <clears throat> and uh, and uh, um, what you can can do is uh, is uh, set up the process uh, to code uh, into the process the interaction uh, this is why we why we have uh, the stand-ups with the 
with our clients and uh, even if, if if there is a client who says that i don't have time for stand-ups we we always force it uh to keep uh, an agile structure because uh, uh even if the client things that oh i described everything in a document just read it and implement it we know that okay one month from now there will be big issues because uh because uh it's it's never that easy that uh, she or he just write down and we just read it so it's better it's better if we have uh, a real real uh, spoken communication on stand ups um this is the most important uh and uh an, an other thing is that uh um if we we can discover okay what are the the strengths of the of the client where where maybe the majority of the recommendations or or requests or de decisions should be done by them and what are the strengths of the of the uh extended team partner then it will be a healthy cooperation so uh, for the client, uh, it's an added value for the same budget uh, that uh, that uh, that uh, that shouldn't be avoided. That uh, they not just buy capacity, but they buy expertise as well. So so it worth to to build on that. Uh, and uh, what what happens really often uh, in in such a, a client and uh, and consultant situation is that. Uh, there is a huge demand for new features um, because it's useful for the business and it's a it's a it's a visible thing in an application especially for for uh, a client from the business uh, background uh, for them the the feature is the valuable output and if we if we talk about uh, refactoring or maintenance of the system or or further development of the of the uh, of the background it sounds like some scary things because it means for the business just cost but nothing uh, visible on the surface of the application so so uh, for example if we just follow the the so-called feature push and we just develop the features and and don't take care of the health of the system then we will face um, a huge problem, uh, um, which is called technology debt. Uh, so we we raise the technology debt when we don't uh, don't uh, care about uh, the the uh, the background questions. But uh, after a quarter or after a half year, we will face a huge huge failure, a huge problem. So it's it's better to 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 maintain the system step by step. Which we usually do uh, within the two weeks uh, sprints. So within a sprint, we recommend uh, putting always something valuable for the business. We never recommend a sprint just refactoring because it's annoying for the business side. Uh, we, re we always recommend something useful for the business, but we always recommend to put in the sprint uh, something which is uh, which is uh, good for the health of the system. So it's a it's kind of a balance, and uh, this way, this way we can uh, we can cooperate. Thank you. <clears throat> Come, the, let me give you. Thank you so much. Okay. The, okay, guys. Do we have uh, more questions? Okay, then uh, then let me talk a little bit about that uh, that aspect how to how to uh, how to balance and uh, and how to fail and how to avoid failure. So we discussed a bit about the the features and uh, and the and the quality. Uh, let's discuss a bit about the roadmap. so so when we when we have a roadmap, uh, then then it's uh, and we if we would like to fail, then it's useful uh, putting uh, really different uh, features on the roadmap which which came from just uh, just last minute uh, client requests uh, and and being being too flexible in that or if we would like to to avoid it then it uh, it's useful being a bit uh, more strict with the users and uh, and uh, and keeping 
the roadmap uh, both flexible in midterm, but uh, but managed well uh, not to let in everything. And uh, if you talk a little bit about user experience, then uh, less is more. Uh, so so if we if we uh, would like to provide a really usable application to the clients, especially for B two C for for uh, consumer uh, users, then we always uh, should take care uh, um, putting in less features and uh, and thinking about how to remove features from the application instead of putting in new and new and new features. It sounds a bit weird and counterintuitive, but uh, but it pays off. Just think about the most popular applications like like uh, like Uber uh, or or Google Search. That the, the simplest uh, solution is the best in most cases. Uh, and 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 other other thing uh, is the is the functional versus non-functional requirements, which we covered a bit. Uh, so far, so uh, if we have <clears throat> requirements, uh, what functions we need in the applications, we we always should take care of the so-called non-functional requirements as well, uh, like uh, uh, what devices should be support, what operation systems or browsers should be support, uh, and so on. So this. Uh, from a business perspective, these uh, non-functional requirements are usually uh, under undervalued, underestimated. But uh, if we would like to provide a seamless solution for the for the users, then we have to calculate with equal focus and uh, and the time and budget for the for the non-functional requirements than what we dedicate for the for the functional ones. And uh, what I brought you as a takeaway. Uh, I realized that the best uh, digital product consultants are the classical philosophers. Uh, so, so I brought two takeaways. Walter said that perfect is the enemy of good, and it's uh, it's uh, it's true in digital product uh, design and development. So, when we would like to have a perfect solution, it will be a disaster. So, it's better to balance um, an okay solution and. Uh, the market, the technology, uh, to balance these aspects, and uh, and this way we can find a healthy, healthy setup. And uh, <clears throat> I learned from Aristotle that uh, the golden mean is uh, is uh, a good rule for for uh, many um, situations. In in many questions, it's a it's a good it's a good answer. So as we as we checked. Uh, the extremes in uh, in product development uh, are are never uh, working well. So so if we are facing a, a question or a situation uh, similarly what you you both asked, uh, either just the clients or just the experts, uh, just the market or just the technology, the answer in most cases is uh, is a golden mean. So we should find the the, the middle. Middle way, and that way we can uh, we can have a healthy business with a good digital pillar as well. So, thank you, thank you very much. <clears throat> Great, thank you, Balint. Very pragmatic presentation. I think people should really who are thinking of developing a digital product to speak to somebody like Balint because this is very truthful and very clear and very experienced. And always good to finish with a quote from Aristotle, I always find in a presentation. <laughs> so this morning, um, Matthew presented a really good presentation from Gallon Growth, and I hope you can live up to the expectations of the morning, Matthew. So over to you. Can I, um, yeah. So uh, good afternoon. Um, I think we're into the final session. Uh, I'm going to uh, probably try and get you out of here on time. So um, this next presentation is about digital health partnerships, specifically around insurer, digital health partnerships. But there's lots of information generally about digital health as well. Um, so I'm from Gallant Growth. Um, I'm from Singapore. And um, we basically focus on digital health. We only do digital health and we analyze digital health across the world. Uh, so 
before I get into a little bit more about who we are, just to set the scene of what I'm going to cover. So a little bit about us and what we do. Not too much on that. I'll get through that pretty quickly. I'm going to give you a quick top line of what we see in digital health worldwide, some of the key trends that we're seeing in digital health. Then we're going to have a quick look at some of the insurers and what they're doing in digital health, who they're partnering with and why. And then um, look at some of the specifics around insurer partnerships as well. And then what can we expect in 2022? So very quickly, just about our scale and growth. So, yeah, we're based in Singapore. We do have a regional office in, um, in Switzerland as well. And what we do is we go out and we analyze every single digital health partnership worldwide. We aggregate lots of data around that digital health venture. So we collect about 200 different data points on every single venture worldwide. We bring them back into our platform and then we use that platform to advise and help insurers and pharmaceuticals on how to partner with what kind of companies in digital health. So if an insurer or a pharma has got a specific problem statement and they're looking for an external solution, that's where we step in and help them. So in terms of our data, uh, we cover in our platform and our analysis 8,500 digital health startups worldwide. Uh, we look at 8,700 8, investors in digital health worldwide. We track 22,000 partnerships in digital health worldwide. And those partnerships are typically done by one of or many of 7,500 corporates, again, worldwide. So all of that data together amounts to about 150 million data points on our platforms around specific digital health ventures. So uh, just a quick uh, couple of slides on what we're seeing right now. So in 2021, the market in digital health ventures worldwide is continuing to grow, still just under 10% uh, compound annual growth rate over the last five years. So 2021, in the markets that we track, we're now at 8,500 digital ventures worldwide. Um, so the growth is slowing, but it's still substantial. And a lot of that is driven by continually uh, strong, very strong VC and private investment into digital health. So in 2021, we're on track to have a blockbuster year this year of about $40 billion of investment going into digital health. That's a substantial, it's probably going to be double what we saw in uh, 20, 2020. So that, a lot of that's driven by the US market. So in the US market, we're looking at probably 31 to 40 million dollars, sorry, billion uh, dollars of investment uh, in 2021. It's driven by a couple of things. One of them is in the US, there are a lot of special acquisition vehicles and share schemes called SPACs. That's driving a lot of that investment. But the other thing is the growing maturity of digital health. Uh, two quick examples here. Uh, Sword Health, a digital therapeutics company in MSK, it's American. Uh, they recently raised $150 million in a Series D. And Hinge Health, even more, a $650 million round E, uh, giving them a $4.1 billion uh, in valuation. And there are about 20, 20 plus unicorns in digital health in the US. So very, very strong growth coming out of the US. And that's feeding into uh, greater, greater innovation, greater number of digital health startups. So where do we see those digital health startups geographically spread? Um, sort of no surprise, I don't think, but North America, particularly, of course, the US, uh, total about 2,800. That's 2,300 in America and the balance in Canada. Uh, APAC, which is where I'm sort of stationed, 2,300. Of course, many, many different markets in APAC. But the big ones there are China, which has got about 700 digital health ventures, India about 600, Japan about 200, Singapore about 200. Uh, so a very vibrant uh, region there. And also, of course, Europe. In fact, actually, if we drill into Europe a little bit more, seeing as we are in Europe, um, so far the markets that we tracked, we're seeing about 2,000 ventures in Europe. And you can say, I won't read them out, but you can, you can read them here. So UK, very strong, as you can tell by walking around. Uh, the, uh, the exhibition today and yesterday, 600 ventures here and Germany not far, far behind on 400. So very vibrant uh, situation in, in Europe uh, and hopefully more to come. Just a quick slide on DTX. So we split digital therapeutics out. Uh, about 11% growth uh, year on year there. About, uh, what is it? This is 309. 309 ventures in DTX. And about 242 of those have got regulatory approval of some shape or form. 
So quite a, kind of quite a mature different segment of, of DTX and a, spread over a number of therapeutic areas. Mental health is a very significant therapeutic area for all digital health worldwide. So very quickly, drivers of insurance innovation. I won't talk about this too much for too long, but really four key drivers of insurers. So insurers are the second biggest category of vert industry vertical after Pharmaco investing or partnering in digital health. Four main reasons for that. First off, the insurers typically, and I'm sure by your own experience, the insurers, it's not been a great experience working with insurers or being a customer of an insurer. Very uh, paper-driven, very salesperson focused. Um, they are, bless them, really struggling or meeting the challenge, let's say, of transforming the business, digitizing their processes, digitizing the channels, digitizing claims, etc. cetera. Um, quite a slow process for them, but they are really trying to tackle that. And one of the reasons there is customer satisfaction. Insurers um, probably akin to estate agents in terms of NPS scores, typically very negative NPS scores uh, across the world in insurance. So something they're trying to address. Second one, of course, technology enablers, uh, Fitbit, Apple Watch, et cetera, driving an enormous amount of digital biomarker data. And the insurers are now capturing a lot more of this than they ha ever have before and combining that with upskilling their capabilities in digital an analytics, data analytics, and big data. The other big one is the wellness category, which has really exploded over the last five years. Vitality, which you may have heard of, really set the, uh, set the, the pace from 2004, but pretty much every life or health insurer worldwide has got some kind of wellness app of varying degrees of sophistication. At the most basic, they might track your activity in terms of walking and give you a discount on your premium. At the other end of the scale, we're gonna look at Prudential in a minute, who are building out a complete ecosystem on their wellness platform. Fourth big driver, of course, is COVID, which has accelerated everything around digital health, um, but was a particularly strong wake-up call for the insurers who got blindsided really by COVID and realized that they were dependent on a physical sales force, on physical teams handling claims, all of which got disrupted, particularly in APAC by lockdowns. So very much a strong wake up call there. One of the big winners in digital health categories is telemedicine. Uh, and across the world, this is true, but particularly in APAC, a 20 fold increase in teleconsultation uh, appointments and the insurers looked at that and realized, hey, if we can do that with teleconsultation, what else can we do using digital? So quick look at um, where the partnerships are focused. So no real surprise here that they tend to be where you've got a strong contribution from the payer, i.e. The, the insurer, in a health system. So typically the US and APAC, 232 partnerships in the US and 478 in APAC mainly driven by China. These are the top 10 uh, worldwide uh, insurers doing partnerships in digital health. A lot of US companies here, Cigna, Humana, Aetna, um, actually I think Aetna are Dutch, Kaiser and Anthem are all US companies, but we have got a European one here, AXA. And at the far end there, Ping An, an absolute giant in China, uh, as well as China Life. And Ping An especially, in China is even the US insurer companies look at Ping An as a real trailblazer in terms of digital health. Uh, where are the, uh, what are the areas in which the insurers are focused? Uh, typically they focus on areas that are complementary to things like critical illness cover, so oncology, cardio. So in this one here, if you exclude disease agnostic, uh, diabetes is a very significant one of 9%. Uh, oncology and mental health are, is also significant. We're going to cover mental health in a second. And then if we look at digital health cluster, uh, insure tech, telemedicine, uh, patient solutions are, are very significant there. I just wanted to talk a little bit about mental health because mental health um, has become the number one therapeutic area of focus for digital health companies in both the US and Europe. 
uh, certainly measured by inbound investment, a really significant growth there. Um, so uh, about one th over 1,000 mental health partnerships worldwide, and 11% of those are now by insurance companies. So the insurance companies are the biggest partner of mental health, uh, digital health ventures uh, worldwide. And why is that? Um, I'm sure we're all acutely aware of sort of mental health and the impact of COVID and how that's um, been very stressful for all sorts of reasons. In the world of insurance, some of the more uh, financial impacts are that a lot of this is Australia uh, data, by the way. So in Australia, mental health is now the third biggest claim uh, after accidents in MSK. So a very significant uh, percentage there, 11% of all claims. Um, fast growing as well. There's a 53% growth in mental health claims from 2013 to 2018. Uh, mental health claimants were also, if they uh, are absent from work, they're 50% longer uh, away from work than other claims. So if you're an insurer covering group health insurance for a client, for a corporation, that's a very significant cost on your loss claims ratio. So a snapshot of mental health, and these are the top corporate partners uh, and government bodies in mental health. And you can see from this uh, top five here that actually three of the top five are insurer. So Cigna, Aetna, and AXA. And some really interesting partnerships. So Cigna with Talkspace and Aetna with Wiser. And actually, let's take a closer look at sort of what some of these look like. So Wiser, um, you know, key partner of Swiss Re, Aetna, as well as the NHS. This is an interesting company, Indian-based, uh, $5.5 million worth of funding last round. We give every venture, by the way, a score out of a 100. These guys score 71.6. So for an Indian venture, that's a very interesting, mature uh, company coming out of India, doing some really significant partnerships, including one here in the UK. Uh, just one more, so Mentalis, uh, based out of Germany. Um, this one is not so high on the maturity score. Um, these guys are looking at depression and substance use disorder and partnering with uh, two uh, European uh, insurers there. I'm going to skip over this one and get into just a quick example. So Prudential, um, uh, UK HQ company. Um, Many people will be familiar with Prudential, uh, but Prudential are now very significant in Asia. And they have uh, a product called Pulse. And this is probably the best example of an insurer ecosystem application. So Prudential have now done 47 digital partnerships, about 20 of which are in digital health. And they're busy kind of plugging all of that external capability into the Pulse app. And what they're doing is they've moved from simply tracking steps through Fitbit or the Apple Watch and giving you a discount on the premium through to actually building these as a companion, um, really through your entire health journey. So everything from prevention, so that might be capturing data of your habits, if you're a smoker, how heavy are you, and trying to understand kind of risk of future health problems. They're looking at um, disease diagnosis and treatment, nutrition coaching, particularly in markets like India, where diabetes is a very, very significant problem there. And then bringing in some of the insurance products in terms of protection, the insurance coverage products, being able to tell you if you are you know, covered for something that they're sensing in this area, do you have that protection built into your current cover? And if you don't, uh, increasingly offering you a way to buy that insurance through this application. So this is a kind of dual fold strategy really. One is to keep their customers healthy, reduce claims, and secondly, really using these applications as a way to drive customer acquisition. Uh, in fact, uh, just on this slide, so they in their half yearly report just published uh, August 2021, 30 million downloads, uh, as I said, 47 digital, digital partnerships. And this has driven $158 million worth of sales. 
for an insurer which is making billions of revenue that is actually not that much but it's the beginning of something i think probably quite significant and many many of my other insurance clients across asia really look at prudential and these numbers and the ability for something like an application to reach the underinsured in places like Malaysia and the Philippines, for example. Just a quick analysis. Um, I think this is the last graphs. Um, so what kind of digital health partnerships are they doing? So again, a lot of disease agnostic, but again, mental health, uh, very significant. So 10% of their partnerships are in mental health. Uh, cardio, again, pretty significant, and nutrition and, and diabetes. Interestingly as well, Prudential have got quite an interesting mix of investing in early stage startups as well. In fact, the bulk of their investment has been early stage as Series A, um, some in the growth stage, Series B and above. And they're also a partner of Babylon. So Babylon is, is one of the, the 10%, so a publicly listed uh, company. In fact, the Babylon relationship with Prudential is exclusive to them in Asia, and it covers 11 markets across that part of the world. So, um, yeah, just to wrap up, last two slides, and then uh, I think we're pretty much done with the conference. So if I don't know how many of you are from a digital health venture, but if you are, um, a lot of them come to us and say, how do we work with insurers? In fact, we did a conference with insurers and digital health partners last week. And the sort of the advice was from an insurer, sure. actually from Prudential, um, be super clear. If you're going to work with us, be super clear on your proposition and what KPI in insurance world does your proposition really tackle? Which is sort of an obvious thing to say, but um, they have so many pitches from people that it's really key to understand. They're looking at uh, you know, improving customer satisfaction, driving down claims, or driving up annual policy revenue. So it's normally one of those three. Of course, they're really big, complex organizations, so finding an internal champion is absolutely critical that help you navigate that internal structure. Understand your stakeholders. What are they really motivated around? What are they... KPI'd on, how does your solution help them? How does your solution make them look good? And um, of course, they are complex, large, slow. They are regulated heavily. There's a lot of compliance teams, a lot of data privacy issues. Uh, so have the right expectations going in. You're not gonna change an insurer. Uh, they are a particular breed. They move at their own pace and you just have to work and adapt to that pace. And then lastly, um, for the insurers, last slide, um, I think we're going to see the insurers move from what has been a completely non-digital way of doing business into much more of a hybrid way. So we're going to see still salespeople, your traditional sales agent that goes knocking on the door and selling to friends and family. That's going to still continue, but increasingly they'll be armed with uh, you know, a tablet, uh, an app that's giving them access to a world of information that's helping that sales process. And also for the customer as well, something like the Pulse app is going to become a primary way that you're going to start to interface with an insurer in the future, in the life and health segment anyway. Uh, what else? End-to-end -end wellness platforms. Yeah, so I've already said this, moving into like quite an interesting space in terms of really a true companion uh, for digital health uh, and keeping you healthy right the way through your uh, your relationship with insurer. The other key one they're going to start to move to is they start to understand now this, uh, some interesting implications from the level of data and information they're beginning to capture. It used to be actually the insurers did not really have that much data. They were disintermediated by a traditional sales channel they never collected any direct data really from the, from the, from the customer. So now with something like uh, wellness platforms connected to a digital input device, they're actually capturing a lot of very personal information now. They might start to use that to actually get to dynamic pricing. So the actuarial people who base pricing on 30, 40 years worth of experience of mortality rates 
now they're going to have the ability to get fine tune and get into segments and understand risk by particular customer segments in a lot more granular detail. And that might mean that there are winners and losers when it comes to pricing, depending on what they see in terms of your lifestyle. So that could be a good thing, but there is also some interesting um, regulatory kind of issues that might emerge in that in that one. Um, and then, yeah, the, the, the last one there is, if you've ever applied for a life insurance policy, it's really generally quite painful. It's very slow, particularly if you fall outside um, a risk tolerance and you go into a manual underwriting process, that can take six months. So a lot of the insurers, and it's expensive because you've got to do fluids. You've got to get the customer to a doctor, take the bloods, do the analysis, analyze it, and then decide if you're going to underwrite them. So what increasing they're trying to look at is how do we get to non-invasive testing, uh, liquid biopsies, uh, data to understand risk on a better basis so that you can do straight through underwriting. So that's it. Thanks. Thank you so much for sticking with it. Um, uh, that's it. That's it for me. If, has anybody got any questions about not just insurance, but anything about digital health or any trends around digital health worldwide? Uh, I, a few I've, I'll start off and I'll pass over to, to Tal in, in a second. Um, you, you present about pharma, pharmaceuticals in the morning and yeah. in, insurers now. Obviously, insurers are very distant second, but in terms of the necessity and urgency of digital transformation, would you say insurers are way, way ahead of, of pharma due to urgency? Um, I'd say probably, I'm less familiar with pharma because my particular clients are insurer. Mm. Um, they're quite different beasts because whereas digital health is really quite fundamental, when you think about therapeutic focus mm. areas, it's very core to a pharmaceutical, it is somewhat core to an insurer. So this is why they're slightly lagging in terms of volume of partnerships versus say pharmaceutical. However, I think they're, particularly this year actually, I think there's been, a, and again, it's back to COVID. There's been a real wake up call of the need to rapidly transform and actually stop talking about this, which is what they've been doing for like a decade. They all knew that this world was going to become one day, and but now it really is here. So they're all scrambling to really kind of innovate quickly. So I, I think um, we could well see them sort of overtake pharma and become with something like Pulse a lot more innovative potentially than pharma, I mean, especially in a course of direct to consumer model. Yeah, I, yeah. Think, I think they're more vulnerable and they should, they yeah. should be thinking. Uh, Thank you, that was really interesting actually. Um, first time I've stayed awake during a presentation on insurance <laughs> companies. Yeah. So well done, you. Um, yeah. It is interesting, isn't it? Because because insurance companies are bigger than pharmaceuticals, and they've got a they haven't got a conflict because there's cannibalism, isn't there, for a pharmaceutical company to to work on digital therapeutics and stuff. So. The conflict in the insurance, though, is I think you can find some monitor watches and movement, but a lot of what we do in clinics is around what patient symptoms are or patient reported mm. stuff, mm. which then I suppose if do you think that will result in patients not reporting symptoms? And also, if they don't honestly report symptoms, then will that then? Because you know they always say if you if you yeah. don't do that, when you, you, yeah. or if you if you lie at any point, we yeah. will we will arrest you and torture you, and we will um, validate your insurance yeah. and you use fraud, and you go to court and all that stuff. Yeah. All that stuff you hear while you're waiting on the phone. Yeah. So I just wonder that the next step, is, um, other than movement, is going to have to be asking patients about symptoms and and that's mm. the, that's the big conflict there i think yeah it's an interesting area um you, you probably saw it earliest in sort of dna where actually a lot of there's a lot of regulation passed that insurers cannot 
um, use DNA results to you know price you out of the market, for example. So there may be some aspects of that that sort of come in and that give the consumer the confidence to actually, okay, I am willing to share my information. But if you were, if you were, say, um, a six-year-old male, overweight, smoking, and a, with a drinking habit, um, you're probably not, you know, you're not going, you're not, you're not going to be incentivized, especially if you know if they're going to be moving to dynamic pricing. Um, but it won't ever depending on the level of cover of the insurance it will never just be self disclosed i don't think unless the technology and the way of um, validating the customer inputs get so sophisticated it's very hard to game the system so the the higher risk segments will always be streamed out or something like that and there'll be probably still a manual manual check but the way in which that manual check is going to happen will be a lot more sophisticated and quicker than it is now. We just worked with an insurer actually in the US who are very interested in early diagnosis of cancer um, and engaged us to actually find companies that were doing, uh, you know, not involving biopsy, but actually uh, understanding DNA fragments from certain types of cancer in the bloodstream as an early diagnosis product. So you got, I think we're going to see a lot more of that kind of sophistication coming. Um, but yeah, for high risk pools, they will, the insurers are very risk averse, and they always will be. That's their that's their business. So there will always be safeguards to to shore up um, higher risk groups. So dynamic pricing sounds fantastic, doesn't it? But actually, it raises premiums for the average. Could so it, could do. it's yeah. It only works if you're young and fit and well. That's the, I think that's the thing that's going to that will be the big that you're right that, that's the that's the potential you know, you know negative of this yeah but this is where I think um, well the, the first thing is it's going to take actually at least five to ten years before the data and preventative health apps they truly start to understand Do, does any of that make a difference actually to mortality rates because they don't they don't really understand it yet. And then on the actuary bit, where they're trying to forecast mortality rates, that's a very, very slow-moving beast. So when I talk to them, they say between five and ten years before you start, we're, we're in a position where we might be able to do sort of some kind of dynamic pricing. I, I suspect it will be sort of playing around the edges. They'll be very careful in terms of government regulation as well. But um, it's certainly going to be some, you know, there's going to be some interesting moral as well as commercial things that uh, start to come from this yeah because i was just gonna um sorry my name is becky i'm okay. co-founder of lumino which is a dtx company um yeah. just going on from that i think that there are some interesting ethical issues so my background is exclusively pretty much in mental health and as soon as you start talking to mental health charities in this country about the insurance market you will hear an awful lot of horror stories about right. people not being able to get coverage for all sorts yeah. of things and yeah. being, you know, people who've got particularly sort of complex backgrounds, particularly if they've had um, suicidal yeah. ideation or su suicidal kind of episodes in the past. Yeah being honest about that with anything to do with an insurance company mm. is actually really, really difficult. So mm. I'm just thinking from a, from a, a digital therapeutics perspective, mm. as opposed to a broader digital mm. health thing, what sorts of opportunities do you think are there really for digital therapeutics? Because I was sort of thinking that our kind of route in was much more with the providers, potentially private providers who are providing services that are insured. Um, Hmm. Not they say no. No. I think the insurance are better it's very much of course in the insurer's benefit yeah. to keep everybody alive and healthy. So they're you know, they're incentivized to do that. Uh, I mean, the, the question around does, does DTX um, in mental health have any kind of positive benefit? Um, go and have a look at some of these, these examples and check them out. I mean, yeah, well, they, they, I don't know how much real world evidence there is yet, but p the potential is, is there. Um, you know, certainly in terms of, you know, 
uh, treating you know, anxiety, calmness apps, um, sleep disorders, that kind of thing. I think the DTX piece can help. I don't think um, anybody would be claiming that if somebody gets into significant distress or is suicidal, you know, these apps are not not the answer. In fact, actually, if you did, if you heard the Happyfy one yesterday, yeah, they have that emergency. And, sort of and this is out. my area. So yeah. it's 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 just really interesting that sort of talking to people who have developed really successful um, DTX products that are used in cognitive behavioral therapy to help yeah. people with various sorts of things. And we, we heard from Charlotte yesterday from Big Health, I think what they've done with sleep here is absolutely amazing. Um, but when they talk about their kind of go to market, I don't hear companies like that talking an awful lot about insurers and insurance companies making these sorts of products available to their users. I wonder if they're missing it's, a trick actually. Well, it's quite, it, sorry, just, to, just a real quick data point there, which is it's quite new for insurers to actually even have to worry about mental health in a way, because actually the Australia example, the reason that slides in there is that the Australia government passed a law, and so have, so have the India, saying that actually insurers have to provide coverage around mental health. Well, and the Australian system is a whole other thing when it comes to mental health because you don't really get counselling on the on their oh, national okay, health okay, services okay. we do here. Right. So it's there's some very very specific right. things about yeah. the Australian system yeah. that make that interesting. But yeah, yeah. Um, so either AIA or AXA did an interesting product in uh, Singapore, which covers things like um, obsessive compulsive disorder and some certain kind of bipolar disorders as well. So. You know, it's quite early for the insurers in this in this piece, but I think they can see certainly over the last two years all the way the metrics are going with, with mental health and some the way it's hitting their bottom line. You know, they can see that it's, it's a significant issue. So yeah. that's why you're seeing a lot more activity there at least. Yeah. Really interesting presentation. Thank okay. you. Thanks. Okay. Any last questions? No, I think we're good. Right. Over to you, Tony. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Matthew. Thanks for closing with an excellent okay. presentation. And uh, I'd like to thank everybody in the audience here and uh, through the uh, online channel, and also to the um, the giant uh, staff and team who have done a fantastic job in Barry. And we're looking forward to welcoming you in 2022. Thank you very much. Thank you.